Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, this is, I'll, I'll be the ruling judge today. I'm going to give everybody a couple minutes to arrive. Feel free to have your video on or off um, and we'll get started shortly.
morning. Before we begin today, do the teams have all participants present on the Zoom chat that they are anticipating? Yes, Your Honor, the plaintiff does. And for defense? Your Honor, it looks like we, our expert has not arrived yet, but otherwise, I believe we are all here. Okay, do you wanna, we can give it a few minutes for the expert to arrive. I know we're right at eight o'clock now, so we'll give a few minutes uh, for some technological difficulties. Thank you, I'll let you know as soon as we see them. Thank you, are you Ms. Kaplan? I am, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. I'm gonna step away just for a moment while we are waiting. Our expert has arrived, Your Honor. Thank you, and I think any delay on that may be attributed to me not letting him in on time. So um, we won't hold that against you. Um, so good morning and welcome to the fourth round of this year's Summit Cup tournament. Will the attorneys please enter their appearances? Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Jen Stern, counsel for the plaintiff, and I, along with my partner, Terrence Jones, Your Honor, that's T-E-R-E-N-C-E. -E. Represent Cam Donaldson in today's case. We are Team Mount Antero, and of course, after a defense counsel has an opportunity to introduce themselves, we just have a few procedural matters, as well as two pretrial motions. Thank you. Ms. Stern, in for the defense? Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Jenny Kaplan on behalf of Defendant Karen Baja. Good morning, Your Honor. Patricia Drennan on behalf of the defendant, Karen Baja. And our team is Gray's Peak. And we've also prepared a notice of appearance. Would it be okay if I sent that to you via the chat feature of Zoom? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then um, are there anything before we move to uh, pretrial matters and motions in limine? Nothing else from the defendant, Your Honor. Nothing okay. else from the defendant. And a brief procedural check on our end. There are two judges, scoring jurors present in the courtroom. Does anyone on either team believe that there is a conflict that would affect your ability to provide an unbiased evaluation? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay, and, and I don't believe I have a conflict either. So at this time, I believe we are prepared to proceed. Is the plaintiff prepared to proceed as well? Yes, Your Honor. In the defense? Yes, Your Honor. At this point, we will do this swearing in. Please raise your right hand. 
Okay, please indicate by saying I do if you swear to abide by the rules of this proceeding and conduct yourself in a manner that is honorable to this forum. I do. I do. Okay, so we are now calling the case number 082263, Cam Donaldson versus Karen Bassa. There were some housekeeping matters. We will start with the plaintiff. Your Honor, as we make objections throughout the case and ask to approach sidebar for evidentiary arguments, may we assume the sidebar is constructive and simply remain in this Zoom room? Absolutely, yes. Once an exhibit is entered into evidence, may we publish those exhibits by using the screen share function? You may. We've also prepared a PowerPoint to use during opening statement. We spoke with opposing counsel pre-trial and they have no objection to the content of the PowerPoint. May we have the court's permission to use it during opening statement? Is that your understanding, defense? Yes, Your Honor. You may. We just want to uh, put the court on notice that normally we would ask to sequester the witnesses pursuant to Rule 615, but since the witnesses in today's case are all parties and experts, we are not seeking sequestration. Thank you for that notice. Anything further? Yes, and lastly, oh, actually, nope. Sorry, Your Honor, that uh, concludes our procedural matters. And are there any... Oh. I'll check with defense. Are there any procedural matters with de for defense as well? We would only add that we ask that witnesses be constructively sworn. Absolutely. Thank you, Your Honor. And then we will move on to motions in limine. Are there motions in limine for the plaintiff? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we have two motions, but I just want to put the court on notice that the parties, again, we met pre-trial and we've agreed that neither party will reference or use Three photographs found on pages 60 to 62 of the record. Defense, is that your understanding as well? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you for that stipulation. There was a second motion in limine? Yes, there, there are actually two. Uh, the okay. first, Your Honor, by way of background, and as the court is aware, this is a wrongful death action that Cam Donaldson filed against the defendant, Karen Baja asserting that the defendant killed her husband. Uh, we move to exclude any testimony regarding the fact that the defendant was never charged criminally under Rule 401 as it is irrelevant in today's civil wrongful death action. As the court certainly knows, there are a number of reasons as to why the police may not charge a suspect. There's inherent ambiguity and it's ultimately an opinion of somebody else not involved in today's case. Therefore, we move to exclude any evidence or testimony as to the lack of criminal charge because it's irrelevant under Rule 401 and the probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice pursuant to Rule 403. Defense, do you have a response? Uh, Your Honor, we do not intend to discuss um, that Ms. Baja has not been charged criminally. We wouldn't be using those terms. We would indicate that there is still an open police investigation into Lou Donaldson's disappearance, but we wouldn't be saying that Ms. Baja had not been charged criminally. We wouldn't be using that kind of language. We would indicate that there was no um, evidence of a crime. So I wanted to make sure that would, that would still be okay. And, and, and Ms. Stern, does that satisfy your concerns in this matter? Yes, it does. Uh, so long as opposing counsel does not reference the fact that the police did not charge uh, the defendant with a crime. Okay, so it's, it seems really that there's a stipulation on that matter. Um, I will allow, so at this point in time, I'll, I'll accept the representations of both parties. Ms. Stern, if you, or Ms. Stern or Mr. Jones, if you feel as though um, that stipulation is, is being crossed or, or if you feel as though um, we get to a point that it is going into what the criminal charge is, feel free to, to object contemporaneously. Understood, Your Honor. And with regard to our second motion, normally I would not address an actual hearsay statement because I understand the court would probably want to hear it in context, but these statements are particularly important and we have a good faith basis that they will be admissible. 
we're seeking an affirmative ruling regarding the admissibility of two statements that sort of go hand in hand made by the victim in this case, Lou Donaldson. Just two weeks before Lou Donaldson died, the plaintiff overheard her father and the defendant having a heated argument during which Mr. Donaldson told the defendant he was going to file for a divorce. Immediately after that fight, Lou Donaldson came out visibly shaken and Cam Donaldson will testify that she had never seen her father like that before. And in that moment, while still shaken, Lou Donaldson told the plaintiff, if anything happens to me, tell the police to look at Karen because she will be responsible for my death. We're seeking to admit those two statements. The statement that he planned on getting a divorce is admissible under Rule 8033 to show Lou Donaldson's state of mind. And the second statement where he said, if anything happens to me, look at Karen, is an excited utterance. In a response from the defense. Your Honor, we disagree on the admissibility of the statement. If anything should happen to me, look at uh, Karen Baja that we disagree that falls under any hearsay exception. We do believe that it's inadmissible hearsay. It's not a state of mind. It's not a forward looking action. Um, and I, I, with the exception if, of laying a proper foundation that it was truly an excited utterance, it wouldn't fall under that exception either. Um, so we do feel that, that statement, if anything should happen to me, look at Karen Baja is inadmissible. The other statement of um, I'm planning to get a divorce we understand that that would fall under a hearsay exception of a forward-looking statement. Okay, and I tend to agree that, that the statement about the plan to get a divorce does fall under 803. I also agree that the statement, if anything happens, um, look at Ms. Baja may be admissible given proper foundation, but I really do think that that is, um, needs to be, that ruling needs to be made in the context of the case. Um, so I will reserve ruling on the statement if anything happens, but it sounds like there is a stipulation that the plan to get a divorce would be admissible under 803. Your Honor, we uh, had intended on using the making reference to that second statement, the if anything happens to me during opening statement. Is there enough of a good faith basis to reference that? Well, in, in counsel, I don't know. It, that's up to you. You're, you're an officer of the court. I don't know the foundation you plan to lay. If you do believe that it is admissible um, and that it will be admitted, feel free to present that during opening statement. Um, I, I don't know the facts that you may lay, but it, it sounds like you do have a good faith basis in my opinion, but, but um, it's your ethical duty. So rely on that. Um, and if it is a situation that it does not end up coming in. I think we can cure any prejudice with a um, instruction to the jury. Yes, Your Honor. And that concludes our substantive motions. The plaintiff is prepared for opening statements. Defense, are there any motions in limine for you? Uh, no motions. I would like to add, there was an additional stipulation to the admissibility of the will. Um, opposing counsel and our team spoke earlier um, and we will still Either team would admit that into evidence, but we have agreed to the admissibility. And in addition, we have agreed that each of us will, at some point during the trial, introduce a photo of a big cat. And we have agreed to the admissibility of that, and you will see it will still properly move it into evidence at the appropriate time. Are there, is there an exhibit number for the will? Uh, yes, plaintiff, I think, has one. Yes, well, we were planning on sort of admitting the exhibits as we went along, but we can certainly pre-mark those now as exhibit one, if your honor would like. If they're not pre-marked, we can, um, we'll, we'll use the numbers as you move along. Okay, great. What, whatever, you. whatever you had planned to do, we can proceed that way um, if they're not already pre-marked. Your honor, if you would like, we actually have an exhibit binder that has all of just the exhibits. Um, we can share that through the um, chat function, if that would be helpful for you, um, as far as when we reference an exhibit, we'll say, oh, the, the, it was bookmarked in the exhibit binder as such, and we are now marking it as plaintiff's exhibit, whatever, for identification. Is that a binder that would include all exhibits that defense would enter and the, the plaintiff would enter? I believe Is it so. All Is that discovery? Yes, Your Honor. And, and defense, do you have an opinion on whether or not I received that binder? 
we haven't seen the binder, so we haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, so I guess that would give us a bit of hesitation, but if it includes all the potential um, exhibits, you know, we're not opposed to that, aside from that we haven't, it, as long as it wasn't, you know, obviously pertaining to admissibility particularly, because we would like to weigh in if there was an issue during the Absolutely. And, and you know what, I understand your hesitation. I do have a copy of a discovery in the case file. So at this point in time, I don't believe I need the separate binder, um, given the hesitation that is completely understandable. Um, are there any other motions in Lemonade that you would like or any other pretrial matters before opening statements? None from the defendant. We are ready to proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. With that, at this point in time, I understand that it is up to the parties whether or not you want to have your videos on or off. So feel free to take a moment to prepare. Um, plaintiff, are you prepared for opening statements? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, may I proceed? You may. It's Friday, eight years ago. Cam Donaldson is just about to leave work when she sees her coworker, her father, Lou Donaldson, the man she admires more than anyone else. Together, they work at Wild Wildlife. It's a big cat emporium for lions and tigers. But when Cam Donaldson leaves work that day, she leaves her father alone with the defendant, Karen Baja, Lou's wife. You see, what Cam Donaldson did not know, you know what, what Cam Donaldson could not know was that that day would be the last day she sees her father alive. What Cam Donaldson soon realized is what all of you will soon realize. That the reason she never sees her father again is because the defendant refused to take no for an answer and instead took matters into her, excuse me, her own hands. The defendant never, excuse me, Cam Donaldson never could have dreamed of bringing this lawsuit against her own stepmother to vindicate her own father. But she did, and she had to, because the defendant took matters into her own hands by killing her father. Now, as the plaintiff, we have the burden of proof. We have to show you that it is just more likely than not that Lou Donaldson's death was caused by the defendant's intentional or reckless conduct. And we will do exactly that when you keep these two key facts in mind. Number one, the defendant refused to take no for an answer. And number two, the defendant took matters into her own hands. So let's look at that first key fact. The defendant, well, she refused to take no for an answer. Today, you're gonna hear that Lou Donaldson, he was a self-made man. But the defendant, on the other hand, she wasn't quite so lucky. That is until she met Lou. Because the day that she married Lou was the day her life changed. She now had a life that afforded hundreds of cats and gave her millions of dollars. But all of that was put in jeopardy the day that Lou Donaldson mentioned a divorce. A divorce that would have left the defendant alone with no cats and no money. You see, for the defendant, that wasn't an option. Now, she refused to take no for an answer, which put a, a strain on their relationship. In fact, their relationship got so bad that it caused them, 
it caused their relationship to spiral. Lou Donaldson, you see, he filed for a temporary restraining order. In other words, Lou Donaldson, he was so scared of his wife that he asked the court to order, the, order his wife to stay away from him. Ladies and gentlemen, when you hear about why he wanted a temporary restraining order, it will be clear that he was scared of his wife. Scared because she refused to take no for an answer and scared because his life would end just two months later. Which brings me to my second key point. The defendant, she took matters into her own hands. Today, you're going to hear that the defendant actually confessed to killing her husband. In fact, you're going to hear how she confessed to it. You're going to hear the testimony of someone who will say that she said she, she, she fed her husband to the very tigers that he took care of for 20 years. And honestly, ladies and gentlemen, if that's not enough, if the confession's not enough, there are circumstances. Now, we'll be the first to tell you that this case is a little unique. We're talking about tigers and lions here. But this is not CSI. This is not law and order. It's definitely not some crazy Netflix series. This is a civil case. And in a civil case, all we need to do is show you that it's just barely more likely than not that the defendant killed her husband. We're going to do that through circumstances. Circumstances like wild wildlife, a place that houses lions and tigers. Circumstances like a meat grinder, a meat grinder that's so large the defendant will, will be forced to say it can fit a body inside. Circumstances like the defendant's outrageous alibi. An alibi that includes her brother, who just happens to work at the deputy sheriff's office, who just happens to work as the deputy sheriff. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the same sheriff's office that is investigating the disappearance of Lou Donaldson. But perhaps one of the most compelling circumstances of all is time. Pay attention to the timing of the defendant's conduct after Lou Donaldson's death. Pay attention to the timing of the signing of the will. Pay attention to the fact that just two weeks before Lou Donaldson disappeared, he told his daughter, if anything were to happen to me, make sure the police look into Karen. When you consider all of these circumstances, it will be clear that the defendant refused to take no for an answer and instead took matters into her own hands. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet Cam Donaldson. Cam, can you turn your video feed on so that the jury can hear you? Members of the jury, this is Cam. Cam, she no longer has a father. She no longer has a partner to eat popcorn with when she goes to the movies. When Cam Donaldson decides to get married, she doesn't have a father to walk her down the aisle. Cam Donaldson was robbed of these experiences which is why she's before you today. She's here asking you to tell the defendant, you can't refuse to take no for an answer. You can't take matters into your own hands. The only way for you to tell this to the defendant is that when, when my co-counsel Jen Stern comes before you and asks you to bring back a verdict, the only verdict consistent with the evidence, you can tell the defendant by finding her liable. 
Thank you. In August 2012, Lou Donaldson made the decision to leave his wife, Karen Baja, to make sure that the animals that they cared for and protected were in the best possible hands, he left them with her. You will hear today that there was only one person he wanted taking care of their beloved animals, and that was Karen Baja. Karen Baja had nothing to do with the disappearance of Lou Donaldson. During their opening statements, the plaintiff told you that Lou Donaldson is dead. There's no evidence of that. You'll begin to realize today that Lou Donaldson may still be alive. Because a disappearance is not death and an accusation is not evidence. Now let me introduce you to Karen Baja. Ms. Baja, could you please turn on your camera? Karen Baja is a loving wife that came from humble beginnings, working hard to make something of herself. Together with her husband, Lou Donaldson, she pursued a passion for animals through their big cat sanctuary, Wild Wildlife. And when I say big cats, I mean lions and tigers, literally. It's not the most typical thing, but it's what she loves and she cares for those animals as if they were her own family. Thank you, Ms. Baja. There came a point in time in 2012 when Ms. Baja and her husband, Lou, were having some marital problems and he wanted to leave her. He wanted out of his marriage and he wanted out fast. Divorce would take too long. So Lou Donaldson came up with a plan. He was a pilot who regularly bought and sold airplanes and often took trips without logging his flights. So he knew that he could leave without a trace, head somewhere far away and start a new life. And that's what he did. On August 18th, 2012, in the dark of night, Lou Donaldson headed to an airstrip not far from where they lived got into one of his small private planes and left Karen Baja and Wild Wildlife behind him. You will hear today that his van was found at that airstrip shortly after he disappeared. But Mr. Donaldson loved his big cats and he loved the Wild Wildlife Sanctuary. He wanted to make sure that his lions and tigers were taken care of after he left. He didn't want those big cats or the sanctuary to fall into the wrong hands. So he left behind a will. And that will left everything to Miss Baja. Let me show you the will. Notice the language in it. Mr. Donaldson left his real and personal property to Karen Baja. That includes wild wildlife, and the big cats who live there. In the case that he should die or disappear. Die or disappear. Why would Mr. Donaldson use that word, disappear? It's because he had a plan. The evidence will show that he knew that he was leaving and he was planning ahead. He was leaving Miss Baja but he knew how responsible she was. He knew that she was the only other person who cared for those big cats like he did. So he left those cats in her care. You may also notice that the plaintiff is not included in this will. And that was something that the plaintiff could not live with. So here we are today, the plaintiff is claiming that Miss Baja killed Mr. Donaldson and made a new will. But what evidence is there that Ms. Baja killed Mr. Donaldson? Is there evidence of a struggle? No. DNA evidence? 
No. An eyewitness account? No. A weapon? No. There is absolutely no evidence that Karen Baja killed Mr. Donaldson. And in fact, you will learn that the official police investigation into his disappearance is still open. The plaintiff's case rests entirely on the testimony of a hired private investigator named Taylor Pride. Taylor Pride will testify that the signature on this will was not Lou Donaldson's. But what the plaintiff did not tell you in opening is that this hired private investigator is not a credible handwriting analyst. Taylor Pride took a two week course in handwriting analysis 18 years ago and is going to testify today to whether or not a signature on the will is actually Lou Donaldson's. Taylor Pride has never taught a course in handwriting analysis. They've never been published in the study. And this is a specific area of expertise. So when you hear Taylor Pride's testimony today regarding the signature on this will, remember, Taylor Pride is not a credible handwriting analyst. The plaintiff has the burden of proof in this case. They must prove by a preponderance of the evidence, meaning that it is more likely than not four different things. One, that Lou Donaldson is dead. Two, that Karen Baja caused his death. Three, that the plaintiff suffered as a result. And four, that Karen Baja caused that suffering. You will learn during the course of this trial, there is no such evidence. All the plaintiff has is a disappearance and an accusation. But disappearance is not death and an accusation is not evidence. Members of the jury, at the end of this case, we ask that you find Karen Baja not liable for the wrongful death of Lou Donaldson. Thank you. Your Honor, I think you're muted. Thank you. Is the plaintiff ready to call their first witness? Yes, Your Honor. Before we call our first live witness, we'd like to play a video recorded by Exotic Bob. He is unavailable to testify today pursuant to, stipula pursuant to stipulation number four. We offer the video exhibit one into evidence. My understanding is that it is admissible. Does defense have any objection or response to that? Yes, Your Honor, we do agree that he was stipulated to be um, unavailable and it could be admissible under 804. However, we do not think it falls under an exception to be admissible in that specific uh, hearsay exception. In addition, the statement itself contains several pieces of hearsay that we would aim to have excluded. How, were there any pretrial stipulations as to this piece of evidence? No, there were not. No, Your Honor, we we had discussed it, but um, opposing counsel did inform me that they would have an objection to this video. Okay, I was just reviewing the stipulations that had been filed with the court. Um, are there specific statements that the defense is seeking to exclude at this time? I understand I, this normally, we, I guess defense, would you, would you prefer to make contemporaneous objections or we could have this discussion now. I think contemporaneous might make more sense, but I'll defer to the party's preference, I guess. Um, well, Your Honor, I'm sorry. If I may just be heard as far as the, the video itself and its admissibility. Yes. Um, Exotic Bob states in the video that he, um, that the defendant confessed to killing her husband by feeding him to her, in her words, to her kitties. This is an admission by the defendant, which is clearly admissible as a party opponent admission. And regarding exotic Bob's statements, they are admissible hearsay under Rule 804B3 as statements against interest because Mr. Bob 
concedes to his involvement in illegal dealings, which certainly goes against his interest. And Your Honor, if I may, uh, that's where we disagree. Uh, though it could be perceived as a statement against interest, uh, Mr. Exotic Bob is already in prison. So for him to testify to an illegal dealing, he's already put in prison. So I, it's not really a statement against interest any longer. There's no additional harm that will come from him from making that statement. On the other hand, you know, our uh, Ms. Baja, without any kind of foundation being laid for how she knows this person or any involvement, what the relevance of his testimony would be, it could be very prejudicial to her. Um, that's kind of our concern with the video overall, and also why we don't think it falls under that specific hearsay exception of 804b3. Can you repeat, um, Ms. Stern, the statement, or what is this, why do you think, again, that it's a statement against interest? He states that he was involved in some, I, I believe the words are highly illegal dealings. Uh, and I'm sorry. Did you and, and is that the same? Um, is he serving a conviction for those highly illegal dealings? Is that the same sentence he's serving now? So, yes, we, we believe so. But it is our contention that that does not make the statement that just because he is in prison doesn't mean that it is not a statement against interest. As the court is aware, you know, appellate reasons there, just because he is in prison, him saying, conceding that he was in fact involved. And, and Ms. Stern, I'll, I'll actually pause you right there. I tend to agree with Ms. Stern at this point in time, given the fact, obviously the criminal penalties are are very significant when we're looking at restraints of freedom, but there are also financial consequences, such as a civil case like this, that he could be um, could be charged with. So at this point in time, I, I do think that that statement would be admissible. Um, defense, if there are other objections that to the statement, feel free to make them contemporaneously. Thank you, Your Honor. But I understand and acknowledge defense's argument. So it, it is admitted, Your Honor? Yes, yes. I will still accept contemporaneous objections to, to other statements. Understood, Your Honor. Mr. Uh, may I publish the video by using screen share? You may. And Ms. Stern, I'm not certain that I'm not hearing audio if there is any. Ne neither am I. Mr. Doresh. Sorry about that, Your Honor. Uh, you know, that's part of practicing in the new world <laughs> we live in. It is. Hey, the cat sister, where you put your mister? Feed him to the lion's den. Hey, the cat sister, where you put your mister? Feed him to the lion's den, den, den. Hey there, I'm Exotic Bob. You probably recognize me as the owner of the world famous leopard camp, I See Spots. I want to thank you for your patronage over all these years. I'm currently a guest of the Federal Maxim Security Hotel System. Compliments of one Karen Baja. And that's who I'm here to talk to you about today. You see, it was two years, two weeks, and two days to the day that her husband was last seen alive. She and I was working on a highly illegal deal. We was illegally importing leopards and lions. Leopards was for her, leopards was for me. Lions was for her. Now, we'd never worked together before and we'd never worked together since. But due to the severe illegality of the deal, we thought it best to be worked together, so we did. And at the end of that meeting, Karen Baja walked out of my office. She stopped suddenly, turned around, and she came marching back to my desk, and she leaned over, and she looked me right in the eye, and she said, Exotic Bob? Objection, Your That's Honor. That's me, Exotic Bob. She said, Exotic I'll Bob? Just take a moment to pause. I swear if you don't. And given the forum we're using, could you please, outside the presence of the jury, state the, the statement that you are objecting to? 
Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I, I wasn't sure if I should object at which point on the video, but thank you. And I will, um, we proffer, of course, that uh, Mr. Exotic Bob will say that Karen Baja told him that she would, something along the lines of do him like she did her husband and feed him to the cats. So uh, we argue that that statement is totally separate from the statement against interest, which is what Mr. Exotic Bob has already made during this video, you know, describing an allegedly illegal deal he was involved with with Ms. Baja. Uh, but this upcoming statement of a uh, suggestion that she would feed him to the cats is, is just hearsay and falling under no exception. A response from the plaintiff. Yes, Your Honor, the statement is that Exotic Bob states that the defendant confessed to killing her husband by feeding him to her kitties. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is an admission by the defendant, which is admissible as a party opponent admission. Let me just take a moment. And I, and I think, Ms. Stern, the, the argument is not as to whether this is a statement by a party opponent, but the whether it's against interest. Is, are you resting on your previous record for that? Yes, Your Honor. At this point in time, I'll find that this statement is admissible. Um, given the context, I do think it is encompassed in this statement against interest, and I'll allow the statement into evidence. Double cross me on this deal. I will do to you exactly as I did to my husband. She said, there won't be no disappearance, no mythical flight to Costa Rica. She goes, your last supper will be you. I'll feed you to my kitties just like I did him. And then she turned around and she walked out of my office. That's all I've got to say about that. Hey, the evil woman, where you think you're going? We all know where you've been. Hey, the evil woman, where you think you're going? We all know where you've been. With that, Your Honor, uh, plaintiff is ready to call their first live witness. You may. Your Honor, plaintiff calls um, Cam Donaldson to the stand. Uh, before we begin questioning, Your Honor, um, just for the record's sake, we are we offered that video of Exotic Bob as um, plaintiff exhibit one. Uh, so the next exhibit entered into will be plaintiff's exhibit two. May I proceed, Your Honor? Miss, please introduce yourself to the jury. Morning, my name is Cam Donaldson. Cam, where do you live? I live here in Statesville. How long have you lived here? My whole life. Now, do you work in Statesville? I did, I did. Uh, what do you mean you did? I uh, worked for Wild Wildlife for 20 years um, until the defendant fired me two days after my dad went missing. Now, who's the defendant? Karen Baja. And um, what was her relationship to you? I guess my stepmother. She was my dad's wife. And your dad, who was he? Lou Donaldson. What was your relationship like with your dad? We were really close. Uh, we were best friends. We did so much together and we even worked together at Wild Wildlife for 20 years. And what's Wild Wildlife? It's a pretty unique business. It's, uh, it's a sanctuary, I guess, for wild animals, wild cats, like lions and tigers and leopards, animals like that. And who opened uh, Wild Wildlife? My dad, he always loved animals his whole life, but he started off basically from the bottom selling used cars, but opening something like Wild Wildlife was always his dream. And eventually he opened up once he saved enough money. 
When was the last time you saw your father? That was August 17th, 2012. Uh, where were you when that happened? You were at work. And who else was there? Karen was there. I was there. My dad was saying goodbye. That's the last time I saw him. Do you remember your father saying anything else um, that last time? Yeah. I mean, it was a Friday um, and he waved goodbyes. He walked out the door and said, see you, Cam. I'll see you on Monday unless you want to come over to my house for dinner on Sunday. Were you able to go over for dinner on Sunday? No. Why not? Because that Friday when I saw him wave goodbye as he left the office, that was the last time I ever saw him. Sorry to hear that, Ms. Donaldson. Um, I know that you mentioned that the defendant in this case was married to uh, your father. Um, were you able to observe their marriage? Yeah, I mean, we all work together at Wild Wildlife, so I saw them together almost every day. What was their relationship like in the months leading up to um, his disappearance? It was bad. I heard arguments all the time, screaming so loud sometimes I could hear it from the other room. Your Honor, during pretrial, um, you held under advisement um, a, a particular statement. May I be heard at sidebar? Sorry, Your Honor, you're muted. I'll never get used to that. You may. <laughs> it is very hard to get used to. Um, Your Honor, at this point, um, we plan on asking and laying down the foundations uh, with Ms. Donaldson regarding the excited utterance that we brought up at pretrial. Um, if allowed to continue, Ms. Donaldson is going to say that she heard these arguments often, and there was one argument that stuck out to her in particular. Um, in this argument, they were screaming so loud that she could overhear the fact that they were talking about a divorce. Um, she saw her father, he was visibly shaken, and after she asked him if he was okay, at which point he said, Cam, if, if anything were to happen to me, make sure that the police look into Karen Baja. It is our contention that that statement is an excited utterance and thus an a, um, exception to hearsay. And, and clarification before defense responds, are you claiming that that foundation has already been laid or that you are going to lay it? Um, we have begun to lay that foundation. I just didn't want to overstep before going all the way. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we had this conversation before continuing uh, with questioning. I appreciate the caution. Ms. Kaplan, a response? Uh, Your Honor, thank you. We, of course, as we discussed prior to trial, understand that um, discussion of divorce will likely come up and that Ms. Donaldson was aware of that. But regarding the statement that the opposing counsel is suggesting is an excited utterance, we disagree. Um, even if Ms. Donaldson is able to testify that her father was shaken up, this was after an argument. Ms. Donaldson testified herself. They'd been arguing all summer, uh, indicating that this was not the type of event that would give rise to a excited utterance. Um, and therefore, we do not think it meets that hearsay exception. In addition, uh, the content of that statement is um, not a, any other hearsay exception, such as like state of mind. And um, lastly, I would argue that a statement like that could cause unfair prejudice or run the risk of doing so to the defendant and the probative value would be affected. At this point in time, I, I don't think we're, I think we are kind of halfway down the road and we need to get all the way there before there's a ruling. Um, so I'll let you go and lay some further foundation. Objections are still welcome. Um, I will note that Ms. Kaplan, I am having a, a small bit of difficulty hearing you. Um, just for, for further objections, if I happen to miss something, please don't hesitate to object more than once. Thank you, Your Honor. I will speak up. Okay, and Your Mr. Honor. Jones, you may continue to lay foundation. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, for sake of clarity, uh, would you like me to um, stop right before the statement is made, or can we just go through the statement, and if an objection is necessary, we'll allow the defense to bring that up? You may proceed. Thank you for the warning at this time. I, I do think that you may proceed with the record that's been made there's no need to approach prior to eliciting that statement. Ms. Kaplan may still object. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Donaldson, 
you you mentioned earlier that there were, they had been arguing. You've heard them. Did, did any arguments stick out to you in particular? Yeah, they had been fighting all summer, but there was one that I'll never forget. They were yelling so loud. I could hear it from the room next door. And I heard my dad yell that he wanted a divorce. After he said that, I saw Karen storm right out of the room. And a few minutes later, my dad came out. And I'd never seen him looking that way before. Now, real quick, before um, I ask what happened next, when was this argument in relationship to uh, when he went missing? It was about two weeks before. And when you saw him visibly shaken and visibly upset, what did you, what did you say to him? Yeah, I mean, he was shaking. I, I'd never seen him like that before. So I said, Dad, are you okay? And he looked at me and he said, yeah. Um, at this time, we would like to renew our objection. Uh, we proffer that the witness is likely to say the statement at that time. He said to me, if anything should happen to me, look at Karen. Um, we'd like to renew our uh, previous objection that this is not really an excited utterance because as the witness testified, they had been arguing. And so this would not be a unique occasion resulting in an excited utterance. In addition, we would like to add the statement is entirely speculative and should not come to the record for that reason. Mr. Jones, I will entertain a response to the speculative aspect of the objection. Yes, Your Honor, this is not speculation as um, Cam Donaldson has firsthand knowledge of, of what occurred. She was the one that went up to her father and asked him what he said, and he was the one that said it right back to her. So Cam um, has firsthand knowledge of the statement that was made. I will find that the proper foundation has been laid by Ms. Donaldson that um, the declarant was shaking and visibly upset. I do believe this meets the hearsay exception under 8033. As to speculation, I understand Ms. Kaplan's argument that the declarant may have been speculating, making a guess. Um, however, it, it was, I do think it is relevant under 803 for the purposes of 803 to show what his state of mind was. Um, so I will overrule both, of, both objections. However, they are noted for the record. Mr. Jones, you may proceed. Now, Ms. Donaldson, what did you say to your father when you saw him so visibly shaken? Yeah, I asked my dad, dad, are you okay? And he said, Cam, if anything is to happen to me, have the police look at Karen because she will be the one responsible for my death. Ms. Donaldson, you told us earlier that you last saw your father at Wild Wild Life on Friday, August 17th. When was the last time you were at Wild Wild Life? Well, I think it was two days after I last saw my dad, I was there. Now you said you didn't see him on Sunday, so why did you go to Wild Wild Life? Well, I got an alert that the alarm at Wild Wild Life was going off. We have a, a security system at Wild Wild Life. So of course I rushed over there and I noticed right away that the padlock, we, we have a padlock on the front gate that keeps that secure. It was broken and the back door to the office was smashed. Your Honor, um... There are two photographs in the exhibit binder and they're marked uh, broken lock and broken fence. I'm marking those as exhibits two and exhibits three respectively. Opposing counsel uh, has uh, copies of these exhibits. Uh, may I ask Ms. Donaldson to bring out her copy? You may. Ms. Donaldson, do you have your copies of exhibits two and exhibits three? Yeah. What are, do you recognize them? I do. What is it? These are the pictures from that day. It's the first one is the picture of the um, the broken padlock. And then that other one is that uh, back gate, I guess, kind of thing to the office. And do these photographs fairly and accurately depict the padlock and the gate as you saw them that morning? Yes. Your Honor, I move exhibits two and three into evidence. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibits two and three are entered. Permission to screen share, Your Honor? You may. Now, Ms. Donaldson, can you explain what exhibit uh, two is? 
Yeah, so that's the padlock to our gate. Normally those two little things that are facing to the, I guess it's your guys's right? Using on Zoom, but they normally connect together and that's what keeps the gate locked. But as you can see, it was broken this day. How about exhibit two? That's the back gate to the office that was smashed in. Now, after seeing these, the, the, the gate and the padlock, who else did you see? I saw Karen come out of the office. And anyone else? Some guy. She was with some guy who was carrying lock cutters. Now, was Karen carrying anything? Yes. He was containing a, carrying a lockbox. Do you have any idea of what was inside that lockbox? Yes, because I used to keep that lockbox in my desk drawer. It contained my father's will. Now, how did the defendant appear while she was holding this lockbox? Smug. She was just smiling. And did you ever see the will that was in that lockbox again? No. Uh, well, you said it was a will. I know another will was shown um, earlier. What, what will was that? I don't know. I've never seen that will before this lawsuit or I'm sorry, before Karen showed it to me. Previously, my dad had a different will. That's what he kept in the lockbox. And under this new will, who received your father's assets? 100% to Karen. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Donaldson, you mentioned that your father, Ms. Baja, had argued. Yeah but you never saw a physical altercation. No. And you never saw any violence. No. You never witnessed your Karen Baja threaten your father. No. But you were aware that your father flew planes. Yes, he was a pilot. And you knew that he bought and sold planes. Yeah. And that he kept them at a variety of locations. Yeah but you weren't aware of how many planes he had at any time. No. And you didn't know where he kept all of them. No. But you did know that his pilot's license had been suspended. Yes, it had. And according to you, you he never told you that he was planning a trip that weekend. The weekend that he disappeared? Right. He never said anything about a trip. In fact, he invited me over for dinner that weekend. But it is possible that he went flying that weekend and you wouldn't know. No, my dad always told me when he took a trip. But you can't be sure that he went that weekend or not. Um, I, I mean, I guess not 100%, but he always told me when he was going somewhere and he invited me over for dinner. So. And you would agree that his van was found at an airstrip? the weekend shortly after he went missing? Um, I think it was found a couple weeks later there. So you would agree that it was found at an airstrip? Yes. Now, directing your attention to that morning of August 19th, according to you, the alarm at Wild Wildlife went off. Yes. And you responded to Wild Wildlife. That's right, I went over there, it was like six in the morning, something like that. And the police responded as well. They did. And according to you, the padlock on the chain of the front gate had been broken. Right. And the back gate had been damaged. That's right. And when you responded there, you saw Miss Baja. Yes, I saw her with the man who had the uh, lock cutters. And according to you, she, she was with someone else who was that man. Is that right? The, yeah, the man who was carrying the lock cutters. And you said that she was carrying a lockbox. That's right, that had my father's prior will in it. Which you said that she kept, or that, I'm sorry, that was kept inside of your desk. Yes. And you saw no damage to your desk. I didn't go in. So you're not aware of any damage to your desk? I don't know. But you would agree that Ms. Baja worked at Wild Wildlife. Yeah, she worked there. And so she had keys to the office. 
I don't think she did. So you provided a deposition in this case, is that correct? That's right. And in that deposition, you told the truth. Of course. And in it, nowhere did you mention that Ms. Baja didn't have keys to the office? Nowhere did I say she didn't? No. You would agree that Ms. Baja worked at Wild Wildlife with your father and actually co-owned it. Yeah. But you suggest that she had no keys to the office. Yeah, I don't think she had keys. So when your father took those trips, someone would need to take care of the cats. Is that correct? Yeah. And Miss Baja would often take care of the cats. Mm -hmm. Yes. And your father knew that, that she had a responsibility for those cats. Yes. So that morning when you say that you saw Miss Baja there, you never confronted her. Confronted her about what? When you alleged that you saw her holding the lockbox. Confronted her about what? About that she had the will? Yes, what you've alleged today that you saw her with the will and you never confronted her at that time. Confronted her about what? Holding the will that you say was your father's will. That you say she broke into the office, you never confronted her. I never like said anything about the will. At that point, I didn't even know my dad was missing. So I didn't even know what was going on and the police were there. So I was leaving everything up to them. So you mentioned that the police were there and there was at least one police officer with you. Yeah. But that person's not here today. Uh, I don't think so. And you can't tell us his or her name. No, this was eight years ago. And there was no police report filed. I don't know. I don't. So you allegedly saw Miss Baja that morning, but you never confronted her and you never talked more about this with the police. Again, at this point, I had no idea my dad was missing. I didn't really know what was going on. So according to you, you had reason to believe that Miss Baja had stolen something from the office and you did not talk to her about it or talk to the police. Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered. I'll move on, Your Honor. Okay. So, Ms. Donaldson, you claim that your father told you if anything should ever happen to him to look at Karen. Yeah. But you never told that to the police. No. And you never looked for your father. You never called his friends. Um, I don't remember. And what you did do was you hired a private investigator in 2017. Yeah, I asked them to look into maybe my father's disappearance or what happened to him. So five years after your father had gone missing. Right. And this was after you learned that you were not included in his will. Yeah, I mean, I learned that back in 2012. And so you hired a private investigator five years that later. Yeah, I mean, the police investigation is still ongoing, but I was hoping that somebody could figure this out. You mentioned on direct that you had only ever seen this will during this lawsuit. Um, the will that Karen said? The only will we've seen, yes. Well, sorry, I said that at first, but then I corrected myself. I forgot um, back in 2012. Um, she did show it to me at some point. And so you hired a private investigator five years later after your father had gone. Right. No further questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Redirect. Briefly, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Donaldson, on cross, um, you were asked about, you know, your father's planes, and you said that it was possible that he went on a trip. Um, Prior to today's trial, did you see photographs of the of your father's van at the airstrip? I did. Specifically, did you see photographs of the interior of the van? I did. Your Honor, I'm marking that photograph of the interior of the van as Exhibit 4 for identification purposes. Opposing counsel already has copies of all of the exhibits. Uh, may I ask Ms. Donaldson to bring out her copy? Yes. Ms. Donaldson, can you let me know when you have it? I have it. What is it? This is a picture of the interior of my dad's van. And you've seen this before? Yeah. 
Is it a fair and accurate copy of the picture? It is. Your Honor, I offer Exhibit 4 into evidence. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 4 is entered. Permission to screen share, Your Honor? You may. Is this the photograph that you saw, Ms. Donaldson? Yeah. And what is it? So this is uh, the interior of my dad's van. Um, those are his glasses and those are his keys. They were just how, sitting in a different seat. How often did he wear those glasses? He always wore that same pair. I never saw him without them. Uh, would he wear them while flying? Yeah. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay, uh, may Ms. Donaldson be excused. Any objection to excusing Ms. Donaldson? I am not hearing any. Ms. Donaldson, thank you for your time. Plaintiff, do you have any further witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. The plaintiff now calls Taylor Pride. Thank you. Ms. Pride is constructively sworn. You may begin when you are ready. Good morning. Please introduce yourself to the jury. Hi, my name is Taylor Pride. That's P R I D. What do you do for a living, Ms. Pride? Yes, I'm a certified documenter. I apologize for interrupting. I am having significant issues hearing Ms. Pride. Um, and I, I see some head shaking from Ms. Drennan as well. Ms. Pride, could you move closer to the computer at all or, or raise your voice? Yes, can you hear me now? I can, Ms. Drennan, can you? Yes, Your Honor, I can hear her now. Thank you. I apologize for the interruption, Ms. Stern. You may proceed when you are ready. No problem, Your Honor. I was having some trouble as well. Ms. Pride, you said you're a certified document examiner. What does it mean to be a certified document examiner? Yeah, typically I have to go through a lot of training to get there. Um, I just said I'm certified in um, document examining. I can detect forgeries, so good things like that. Ms. Pride, do you think you could speak up a bit more or maybe move a little closer? Sorry, it's a little hard to hear you. Sure. Um, is this better? Yes. Thank you. Okay. How did you become a certified document examiner? So I went to a two-week seminar um, when I was working at the Economic Crime Unit um, for the PPD. And that was a pretty extensive one. It was by the American Association of Handwriting Analysis. Um, after that, I got certified by the American Board of Forensic Document Examiners, um, and that requires a four-step um, process to get certified. Could you elaborate a little more on what that four-step process was? Yeah, so first I have to provide my credentials and my references to the board. Um, then there's a multiple choice exam that I have to take, and there's also a practical case assignment, and then I also have to submit to an oral exam. You said that before you got certified, you had actually spent some time in the police department. Um, I believe you said in the economic crime unit. What, what would you do there? Yeah, so I spent the, the six years that I was there um, using my two week uh, the training that I went to, and I uh, specifically focused on forgeries. What kind of documents would you analyze for forgeries? Um, there was a variety of things. Um, I did look a lot, at a lot of wills as well. And after you were certified, sorry to jump around, but going back to your handwriting, after you were certified, did you receive any further training in the field? Yeah, so I do keep up to date. Um, I do a eight hour course annually, and then I also read the current literature and I um, do get recertified every four years. Have you ever testified in court as an expert in the field of handwriting analysis and document examination? Certainly, I've testified and been admitted as an expert in handwriting analysis and uh, forensic document examination uh, 15 times over the last couple of years. For which party have you testified? I've testified for all parties, both the um, in a civil case, the plaintiff and defendant, and then also in criminal trials with the prosecution and defense. Your Honor, I offer Taylor Pride as an expert in the field of handwriting analysis and document examination. Any objection or void here? Your Honor. 
she is entered. Can you repeat the tender? Yes, handwriting analysis and document examination. An Thank expert you. in both those fields. You may proceed. Ms. Pride, how did you become involved in this case against Karen Baja? Cam Donaldson hired me back in uh, 2017. Uh, she wanted me to investigate um, and look at a um, will that she believed was forged. You, I think you just blurred out there for a moment, I'm sorry, or at least on my end. Uh, analyze, could you repeat that? Certainly. Um, so Cam Donaldson hired me in 2017 to look into a will um, and just investigate um, the missing, um, her missing father. Are you prepared to give an opinion in court today regarding that will? Yes, I am. What did you review in order to make that determination? So when I was making that determination, I looked at a couple of things, um, mostly the contents of the will, um, the circumstances and timing of when it was signed. And also I compared Mr. Donaldson's known signatures against the one on the will. And are those the types of considerations that other experts in your field rely upon? Yes. Was that enough evidence to come to a conclusion today about whether the will, and just to uh, be clear, the will is the, la the 2012 last will and testament. Did you have enough evidence to come to a conclusion as to whether that will was fraudulent? Yes. Please tell the jury your opinion regarding whether that will was fraudulent. Yes, it is my opinion that the will was fraudulent. The signature was forged. Objection, Your Honor. What is the objection? Your Honor, the defense objects to the terms fraudulent and forgery to be used in the context of this wit witness's testimony in the sense that this is being used as circumstantial evidence to prove one of the elements of wrongful death. To say that something is a will, or sorry, is a forgery or fraudulent is a legal conclusion. And in this situation, because it's circumstantial evidence to support an element of wrongful death, that assertion is best left for the jury to decide at the end of this trial. A response? Your Honor, this expert uh, has just been accepted as an expert in document examination and testified that one of the, the things that she does as an expert in this field is analyze documents for forgery. Uh, she, her, her expert opinion is that it was fraudulent and therefore she should be able to testify and tell the jury what that opinion is. The objection is overruled. Ms. Pride, I'll just ask you again, could you please tell the jury uh, your opinion regarding whether the will was fraudulent? Yes, it is my opinion that the will was indeed fraudulent um, and the signature was forged. How did you come to that conclusion? So, there were a couple of things, uh, mainly three things that I looked at um, when coming to that conclusion. The first was that there was a clause in the will that kind of caught my attention. How about the second? Yes, um, there's also the timing of the will um, in relation to another document. And then the third reason is um, based on my examination of his known signatures. So let's break those down, starting with your first reason, the will itself. Your Honor, I have marked the will as Exhibit 5. Um, we move Exhibit 5 into evidence the parties stipulated to its admissibility pretrial. Any disagreement, Ms. Drummond? None at all, Your Honor. Okay, Exhibit 5 is entered. Permission to publish that exhibit using screen share? You may. Ms. Pride, please explain to the jury what Exhibit 5 is. Yes, so this is the June 2012 will um, sign, or excuse me, um, June 14th will, I believe, of Mr. Donaldson. And it, just to be clear, are, are you stating that it is your opinion that Mr. Donaldson did sign this will? It's a little just semantics, but I just want to make sure we understand. Yes, um, this is the alleged will. Um, and like I said, um, the signature, I believe, is forged. So um, he didn't sign it. And according to the will, who receives Lou Donaldson's estate? That would be Karen Baja. And which portion here, just so the jury is able to see? Oh, 
I, is, is this the portion that you were referring to? Yes, um, this was one of the things I looked at when coming to my conclusion. Um, I thought this phrase was a little odd. Why, what, what made it odd to you? So specifically, um, the phrase or disappear, um, when in, in context with die or disappear, it's unusual. Um, I've looked at hundreds of wills and I've never seen that language before. And why did you analyze the, um, the phrasing of the will? So that's pretty common um, in the field of document examination. You always look to the context, um, whether that's the circumstances of the signing, the language, content of the will itself. And that, um, that clued me in that that was suspicious. And now I want to turn to the second basis that helped form your opinion. You said it had to do with the timing of the will um, compared to another document. What was that other document? Yes, so that other document was a um, temporary restraining order that Lou Donaldson um, filed in court um, against his wife, Karen Baja. Your Honor, I've marked the temporary restraining order as Exhibit 6. Ms. Pride, do you have Exhibit 6 in front of you? Yes, I do. Do you recognize it? Yes. What is it? This is the temporary restraining order um, that I pulled to um, look at his signature and also figure out some context behind the signing of the will. Is it a fair and accurate copy of the temporary restraining order as it appeared on the day or the days that you analyzed it? Yes. And did you rely on it in coming to your opinion for this case? Yes, I did. Your Honor, I move Exhibit 6 into evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the defense objects on the basis of hearsay. The document itself is an admissible hearsay. Any response? Yes, Your Honor. The statements written by Lou Donaldson are admissible hearsay under Rule 8033 to show his state of mind at the time that he filed this. Um, I'm not sure if Your Honor is familiar with the document. I can publish it to you, assuming that we are outside the presence of the jury. That would be helpful. Thank you. So the first statement just I, I am seeking a divorce, which is the second statement, goes to his plan and intent. And the statements that he did not feel safe because the defendant threatened to kill him go to his mental feeling. I will note a good objection for the record and allow the document into evidence. Your Honor, if I may, talk, or if I may respond to that, um, the statements themselves may fall under uh, exceptions, as plaintiff's counsel has just noted. However, the document itself is still in the system. I'll allow the document into evidence as Exhibit 6. Thank you. And Your Honor, now that it's admitted, may I publish it to the jury? You may. Ms. Pride, please tell the jury what Exhibit 6 is. Yes, yeah, so this is the temporary restraining order that was um, filed by Lou Donaldson against his wife, Karen Baja. And you'd mentioned that the timing of this weighed into your ultimate opinion. How so? Yeah, as you can see at the bottom here, the, um, the temporary restraining order was filed June 12th. And just two days after, um, the will was allegedly signed, which um, that stuck out to me as very suspicious. And why did that stick out to you as suspicious? Well, it doesn't make sense to me that someone would file a restraining order and then also two days later give um, or, or try to give someone benefit in their will. Turning to the third and final basis that helped form your opinion, the signature itself. I wanna walk through how a document examiner goes about analyzing a signature for a forgery. What's the first step in that process? So first we gather samples, um, any known samples of the um, person's handwriting who we're trying to figure out what's what, or what the issue is. And after you gather known samples, what's next? Then we analyze the samples for characteristics, looking at like the loops, the common like pressure um, usage, things like that. Um, and then we compare it to the signature that's in question. Mm -hmm. 
assuming that the sig comparing it to the signature in question would be step three. Did you follow that three step process in this case? Yes, I did. Where did you get Lou Donaldson's known signatures from? So the first one that I used, um, I got it from the temporary restraining order that he filed. And I also got the other one from his driver's license. And once you had those known signatures, what did you, what did you do next? Um, then I just, I compared them to the one that's in the row. Your Honor, I've compiled enlargements of those three signatures that Ms. Pride analyzed into one document, just the signatures. Um, and I've marked that as exhibit seven. Ms. Has, has defense seen that exhibit? They have not. And I will happily put it in the chat box right now. If that, if, if I may, Your Honor, it's just the signatures on the document, um, on the temporary restraining order, on the will, and on the report of their expert of the um, of Lou Donaldson's signature from his driver's license. And what are you asking the court right now? If it can be published, or if it if it can be shown to the witness, if it can be entered, I'm I'm not quite sure what the request is. First, if it may be shown to the witness. Um, Ms. Drennan, do you have an opinion on that given you haven't seen the document? Uh, Your Honor, we haven't seen, our side hasn't seen the document previously. Um, it could have been something that could have been discussed prior to the trial, however it was not. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that to your discretion. If the court prefers, I will happily put it and Ms. Drennan, I apologize. I'll, I'll happily put it in the chat box if you want to take a look at it before we even show it to the witness. I think at this point in time, um, you can show it to the witness. I'll defer to to whether or not you share that with Ms. Drennan um, on your own. You can you can Ms. make Drennan, that decision. Ms. Drennan, would you would you prefer to see uh, Mr. Dorosh? Would you mind putting that in the chat box? I'm working on it right now. Need five seconds. Thank you. Could we assume that we're at the sidebar and the jury don't see it and I share it on the screen? Yes. That would have been a better way, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. You Dren Mr. Dren, having the opportunity to see the document, um, do you object to this being shown to the witness? No, you are. Okay, and Ms. Stern, you may proceed then. Ms. Pr Mr. Doris, you could take that down now, please. Thank you very much. Ms. Pride, do you have Exhibit 7 in front of you? Yes, I do. Do you recognize it? Yes, these are the signatures that are compared. Is it a fair and accurate copy of those signatures as they appeared when you analyzed them? Yes. Your Honor, I move Exhibit 7 into evidence. Ms. Drennan, do you have any objections either under, under the rules of evidence or the rules of this forum? Your Honor, you, uh, I'll have to apologize. I'm not familiar with the rule of evidence regarding like, manipulation of various portions of uh, documents that we have received prior to this trial in a new form. So I'm unsure if, if I was to object, I'm unsure of what basis to object on. Um, so in, in that instance, I'll leave it to your discretion. Your Honor, if I may um, just clarify, and I'm, I'm sorry if I was about to cut you off. I just, the, I, it's my understanding that the rules of this forum allowed to sh um, 
enlargements of the exhibits in the record. Um, and that that's why I've created this compilation. Your Honor, that, that compilation that's been shown is a portion of another exhibit in uh, on the record in the overall record. Um, I understand that it seems to be some sort of a redacted version, but my understanding of, of the rules of procedure in this forum is that plaintiff's counsel would need to first present the exhibit as it stands that both sides have seen and are aware of. And then after presenting that to you, go about the redaction process should defense counsel object to any portions of that document. That's, that's my understanding. And my, my understanding is that demonstratives are allowed, but that no exhibits other than those that have been provided with the case material provided in discovery would be admitted today. Um, so I will not admit it into evidence. I will allow plaintiff's counsel to use it as a demonstrative. And just to clarify, Your Honor, um, does that mean that the jury may not see the exhibit? No, you can show it to the jury. You can show this compilation to the jury um, during closing, during the testimony of Ms. Pride, but it will not go back with them for deliberations as an exhibit. Um, but you may use it however you wish in court. Understood, Your Honor. May I publish Exhibit 7? You may. Uh, the demonstrative, as a demonstrative. As a demonstrative? Yeah. Ms. Pride, what did you find when you analyzed uh, Mr. Donaldson's signatures against the signature on the will? Well, I found that the third one was... Um, merged in comparison to the first two. The first two are his known signatures, ones that um, were signed by him. And you can see there's a lot of similarities between the first two, but there's some differences in the third one. What differences did you see or discover? So in the third one, um, the forgers um, lifted the pen much more frequently than the um, first two signatures of Mr. Donaldson. Um, the forger also, um, typically there's a lazy letter in his first two signatures. It's the second O in Donaldson. And um, in the third, um, the third signature, the forged one, um, you can see that the lazy letter, um, what's typically the lazy letter is actually fully written out. What is a lazy letter? Yeah, a lazy letter is um, typically in signatures when an individual doesn't want to um, sign out a letter fully. Um, they kind of like um, make it uh, cohesive in the signature. And as far as the manner of writing, did you notice anything in that regard? Yeah, like I said, the signature on the will, um, the forger did lift the pen much more frequently than Mr. Donaldson. And um, you can see this particularly in the D. Um, Mr. Donaldson um, typically makes two strokes, but it's very slight and it's, you can barely see it almost looks like one stroke. However, in the, um, the forgery, um, you can see that there was a um, complete separate um, two different strokes. And other than um, lifting up the pen, as far as the style of writing, were there any differences? Yes, yeah, so you can, um, here in the signature on the will, you can see some hesitation. Um, for example, there's some ink blotches, especially right on the D. Um, there's quivering, um, more particularly. And that indicates that the individual was writing slowly, um, which is not typical of someone who knows their signature. Um, it's someone who was copying the handwriting and they were um, comparing it. That's why they were writing slowly. Based on the differences you just discussed, what did you determine regarding the signature on the will? Yeah, um, based on that, I determined that it's not Lou Donaldson's signature and it's a forgery. Um, they attempted to um, copy a different signature. Thank you, Ms. Pride. Nothing further, Your Honor. Cross-examination, Ms. Drennan. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Pride, or yes, Ms. Pride, Cam Donaldson hired you? That's correct. She hired me back in 2017. At that time, Lou Dawson had been missing since 2012. Yes, that's correct. You have a background as a police officer. Yes. Then turned detective. Yep. Now you own a private investigator firm. 
yeah, after 16 years on the force, I figured it was time. In your report, you referred to something known as graphology. I'm going to ask you a few questions about that. Absolutely. You can study of handwriting, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. You're a forensic document examiner and private investigator. I am also a handwriting um, analyst expert. Your professional title is private investigator and forensic document examiner. That's fair. You would agree that some documents don't contain handwriting on them. That's correct. You're able to do a forensic examination of a document even if it doesn't include handwriting. That's, yeah. So a forensic document examination can include handwriting analysis. That's correct, but with my time in the economic crime units, um, I spent that time specifically looking at forgeries for six years. Forensic document examination can include handwriting analysis. Yes, looking at forgeries, that's correct. But it's not the same as handwriting analysis, forensic document examination. No, they're two distinct things. You're familiar with the American Association of Handwriting Analysts? Yes. You're not certified by them? No, I'm certified by the Board of Forensic Document Examiners. So you're not certified by the American Association of Handwriting Analysts? That's correct. You never taught a course in handwriting analysis? No, but I have been admitted as an expert in 15 other court cases. You've never taught a course on the subject? No. You're not published in the field of handwriting analysis? No. No further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect? Briefly, Your Honor. Ms. Pride, you said that you received a training to learn how to investigate fraudulent documents. What organization was that training through? Yes, that was through the American Association of Handwriting Analysis. Thank you, Ms. Pride. Nothing further. Thank you. I will excuse the witness unless there's an objection. Hearing no objection, Ms. Pride, you are excused. Thank you for your time. Does the plaintiff have any additional witnesses? The plaintiff rests, Your Honor. May we ask for a quick time check, though? Yes, I think we should be decent on time. Do we have a timekeeper on the line? Yeah, um, so you're at 37 minutes in, and that means you have 70 minutes. So I'm in law school, I'm not a math student. Um, <laughs> 33 left? Yes, oh, yep, that's it. That's consistent with what I have too, Your Honor. Does either side wish for a brief recess prior to um, any motions or defense case in chief? No, Your Honor. Okay. No, no need, Your Honor. Thank you. Now. And any any from our um, from our jurors, does it do any of the jurors need a brief recess? No, Your Honor. Okay. With that, we will proceed. Um, plaintiff has has rest. Are there any motions? Uh, yes, Your Honor. At this time, the defense moves for a directed verdict. Uh, the plaintiff failed to identify the defendant in the Zoom courtroom during the case in chief. As a result, the jury would not have a legally sufficient evidentiary basis to find for the plaintiff. But if that were to be set aside, in addition, the plaintiff has failed to meet their burden of proving beyond um, by a preponderance of the evidence meeting, you know, more likely than not, that Lou Donaldson is actually dead. So they failed to meet the first um, element of the wrongful death cause of action. Uh, in addition, they failed to show that the defendant, Ms. Baja, is actually the cause of his death if he were to be dead, and in addition, that the defendant caused any harm to the plaintiff. Response from the plaintiff. Your Honor, looking at the evidence in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, in this case, us, there has been more than enough evidence submitted for this case to go to the jury. We showed the video from Exotic Bob, which includes an actual confession, Exotic Bob stated that the defendant confessed to feeding her husband to her kitties. Not only that, but Cam Donaldson also testified about what his father told him after the fight uh, that his father had with the defendant regarding an impending divorce. 
Lou Donaldson came out of that fight and immediately told his daughter, if anything were to happen to me, make sure the police look at Karen because she will be the one responsible for my death. And that's exactly what happened because the defendant refused to take no for an answer and instead took matters into her own hands by silencing Lou Donaldson forever. Based on that, Your Honor, we have met our burden and this motion should be denied. The correct standard has been cited. Um, when drawing all inferences in favor of the non-moving party, the plaintiff, I do believe that there is sufficient evidence to submit it, this to a jury. Um, so I will note the objection. It has been recorded. And our, we can move forward to defense case in chief. Defense, do you have witnesses you would like to call? Yes, Your Honor. We call Karen Baja. Okay, Ms. Baja is constructively sworn. You may proceed when you are ready. Ms. Baja, please introduce yourself to the jury. Good afternoon, my name is Karen Baja. Where do you currently live? In Pioneer Statesville. Now, Ms. Baja, I'm gonna ask you about an individual named Lou Donaldson. Are you familiar with this person? Of course, Lou uh, was my husband. And how long were you and Lou married? Well, um, if he had stuck around, we would have been married for almost 20 years. Now, were you here in the courtroom when Cam Donaldson testified? Yes. And did you hear her describe um, arguments during the summer of 2012? Yes. What, can, you, can you tell us about those arguments? Well, um, I will admit that summer was a rough summer, but it was a summer that, you know, before my husband disappeared, we were struggling. Like, like any other couple, we had our issues. We weren't perfect by any means. I, um, I was under the impression that we were working through these issues. Uh, so it was a big surprise to me when Lou had um, told me he wanted a divorce. And so a lot of our arguments stemmed from that, uh, that struggle and that, that, that question that I was not even aware was an issue here. Um, I was under the impression, like I said, that we were working through things. Were you aware that Mr. Donaldson had attempted to get a restraining order? Yes, I was. Um, again, I don't really understand why he wanted a restraining order. Um, we were arguing, but that was, that was all that we were doing. And what happened to that restraining order? It was denied. It was not approved. You mentioned that you had been working through any troubles. Um, what did that, what was happening at the time? What did that look like for your relationship? Well, you know, we, we still lived together. Um, we were still working together every single day um, because our passion above all was the most important thing was taking care of those cats and making sure our relationship was strong enough to be able to do so. Um, so we were still working together, uh, but then he left me. And when you say he left you, um, did he have a way of leaving? Well, uh, he was a pilot. He, it seems he transferred his passion for selling used cars and driving cars to planes. And so he had a small fleet of planes um, that he would buy and sell at any given time. So no one really knew how many planes he had at any moment, but he always would take them on a whim and go um, traveling. And do you know where he went? Well, for the most part, I think he frequented Costa Rica, uh, but beyond that, he didn't really inform me or anyone about where he'd go. He was a pretty private person. And specifically that weekend, um, the August 17th weekend, do you know where he may have gone then? Um, not particularly. I, I know that the police did find his car on an airstrip, um, but beyond that, I don't know. And did you know, I think you mentioned he bought and sold. Did you know how many planes he owned and where he kept them? No, uh, he kept them all over the state at different airstrips and no one really knew how many he owned. 
And were you aware if he regularly filed flight plans before taking a trip? No, he didn't. Now, have you seen your husband Lou since that weekend in 2012? No. What did you do in 2017? Well, by then it had been five years with nothing, nothing from him. No one had seen him, heard from him. And I spent every day up until then praying and hoping he'd come home. But past a certain point, I had to, I had to find closure. And one of the ways that I did that was by having him legally declared dead in probate. And during that time from 2012 onward, what did you do at the business Wild Wildlife? Well, the business was still running. The cats still needed us. So I focused all my attention on the cats. That was my main responsibility from the beginning. And so I made sure that they were, um, they were taken care of. Now, I want to direct your attention to the early morning of August 19th. Uh, do you recall that time? Um, yes, I went to the office like I did every day around 6 a.m. Um, and yeah, I went to the office. What, what was going on when you arrived there? Nothing was happening. It was a normal day. Um, I went in and I did some business before going to check on the cats. And, you know, there was nothing out of the ordinary and I don't have any record of an alarm going off through our system. Did you see anyone else at the office when you were there that morning? Um, no, not that I recall. And Ms. Bajit, tell us a bit more about your responsibilities at Wild Wildlife. So uh, like I said earlier, my main responsibility has always been taking care of the cats. So I feed them, I care for them, I clean their habitats. Um, if we have any cubs born on the premises, I make sure that they're cared for. Um, that could be making sure their mother is, uh, has everything she needs or actually taking care physically of the cubs. Um, and I also handle the business. I'm now the full owner. So I do handle some of the business aspects as well. And during that time period in 2012, did you have access to the office? Absolutely. I was co-owner at the time, so I had access to every part of, of the buildings. Did, is there anything that you can think of that you wouldn't have been able to access with a key or with an open door or something like that? No. Now, Ms. Bajo, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 4. Uh, I'm going to pull that up. Now, oh, I'm sorry, this is, um, we'll go with this. This is actually defense, uh, we'd like to have it. <laughs> well, actually let's proceed with that. Um, Ms. Drennan, thank you for pulling that up. Um, this is one of the items that's been stipulated we'd like to have it constructively marked as defense exhibit A. Uh, Ms. Baja, uh, drawing opposing counsels and the court's attention to it. Uh, Ms. Baja, do you recognize this image? Yes. And could you please tell us how? Um, it's a photo of our favorite big cat, Tara. And was this the only big cat you had at Wild Wildlife? Oh, no, not at all. What does it take to care for animals like Tara? Well, um, they're very unique creatures, but all in all, they just need 24-7 care and attention. Um, they need to make sure that they have all of their needs and we do that for them, we provide it for them um, and we make sure that they feel safe so that they don't cause any um, harm or scare to the public that comes and experiences these cats. So 24 seven care and I'm, I'm always at, <laughs> at their beck and call. And Ms. Baja, for the record, um, is this a fair and accurate representation of Tara and the other big cats at uh, Wild Wildlife? Yes. At uh, this time, Your Honor, we would like to move uh, what has been constructively marked as Defense Exhibit A into evidence. Ms. 
No objection. Any objection? Thank you. No objection, Your Honor. <laughs> it is admitted as Exhibit A. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, now, did Mr. Donaldson know what kind of work you did with the cats at Wild Wildlife? Of course, we worked side by side. And was there anyone else in the business that worked with the cats? No. What about Cam Donaldson? What kind of work did she do at Wild Wildlife? Well, she um, was Lou's assistant, so she assisted him with more business matters. And did she have any of that kind of work with the cats like you did? No. Now, um, I may ask my co-counsel to pull it up or I may be able to. I want to show you Plaintiff's Exhibit 4. Um, let me see if I can grab that. I think she's got, look like she had it. Um, but that's not what I had in mind. I want to, I'm going to, I think I have it open. Um, thank you, Ms. Drennan. Uh, this has been marked, I probably said four earlier and I meant two and three and I apologize. This is plaintiff's exhibit two and three. Uh, Ms. Baja, have you seen this lock or this gate before? Uh, no. Now we spoke earlier about the morning of August 19th when you arrived at the office. Did you notice a broken lock? No. And did you notice damage to the back gate of your business? No, I, I would have noticed damage to my business. Did you uh, cut this lock or associate with anyone who did? No. Why would I destroy my own business? And to reiterate, you did have access to the office. Yes. Uh, thank you. And I want to draw your attention to uh, a person, an individual named Exotic Bob. Are you familiar with this person? Unfortunately, I know him. He's another big cat owner in the area, except for he does very atrocious things to those cats. And I do not associate with him. I actually, that's part of the reason why me and Lou did the work we did to save cats and give them a sanctuary away from people like Exotic Bob. Do you know where Exotic Bob is living today? Yes, he is in prison right now as part of a um, civil suit that I brought against him for the atrocious things he's done. And you never had any deal, or did you ever have any dealings with Exotic Bob? Absolutely not. Now, there's one last thing I want to ask you about, Ms. Baja, and that is the will. I believe Ms. Drennan is going to pull it up for me. Um, this has been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 5. Ms. Baja, have you seen this exhibit before? Yes. How and when? Uh, well, this is my husband's last will and testament, and I saw it on the day that I signed it as a witness. And this other person listed as a witness, Samantha Lane. Are you familiar with that person? Um, only that she was a witness, yes. Now, I want to draw your attention specifically to the second paragraph that begins with I appoint. Could you please read that to, uh, out loud to us? I appoint Karen Baja to be the sole executor of this will, and if I should die or disappear, I give to Karen Baja absolutely all my real and personal property whatsoever. Now, Ms. Baja, did you write that language in this will? No. Did you sign Mr. Donaldson's signature? No. So when you saw this will, what did you, what did Mr. Donaldson leave you? Everything, everything he owned. He left me wild wildlife as full owner, um, which I'm honestly, I'm thankful for because without me, I really, I don't know what would have happened to those cats. Thank you, Ms. Baja. No further questions. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Just wait a second to set up my camera. You know Exotic Bob, right? Yes. Known him for years. 
I've known of him for years, yes. And as the defendant in today's trial, you've been present in the courtroom the whole time? Yes. You've seen all the evidence? Yes. You saw the video of Exotic Bob? Yes. You heard him say that you confessed to killing your husband by feeding him to your, in your words, kitties. Uh, I believe it was his words. He was the one who said it in the video. Um, yes, I did hear that. You do own kitties, correct? Big cats, tigers, lions, yes. Right, you mentioned lions. Your Honor, I've marked a photograph of a lion as Exhibit 7. The parties have stipulated to its admissibility pre-trial. Um, I, I move Exhibit 7 in evidence. We don't have an objection. Thank you. It's admitted. May I publish exhibit seven using screen share? You may. Miss Baja, lions like this one here, they're big. Yes. With large, sharp canine teeth. Yes. Cats like this, they eat a lot. Yes, they do. That's why you have a meat grinder. Yes, it's part of our process to make sure that any kind of meat that we order is processed properly so that they can enjoy it. Your Honor, I've marked the meat grinder as Exhibit 8. Ms. Baja, do you have Exhibit 8 in front of you? Um, do you have the page of the uh, packet that it's on? Um, off the top of my head, I do not, but. Oh, I found it. Okay, great. You recognize this, right? Yes. It's your meat grinder. Uh, yeah, it's it's similar to the one we have. It's, it's your meat grinder. It's the same model, yes. It's a photo of it, yes. It's a fair and accurate depiction of how your meat grinder appeared when your husband suddenly went missing. It's always been there, so yes. Your Honor, I move Exhibit 8 into evidence. Any objection? Uh, yes, Your Honor, both on relevance grounds and as improper character evidence, um, establishing that Ms. Baja owned a meat grinder, um, the plaintiff has failed to establish why showing a photo of the meat grinder to the jury has any relevance to this case. And Respond. May oh, I apologize, you may continue. No, no, that's, uh, that's I was just going to add that in terms of the improper character evidence that they're implying that she used the meat grinder um, on her husband without establishing any foundation for that. Thank you, Your Honor. Any response? Yes, Your Honor. As we heard, Exotic Bob testified that the defendant confessed to killing her husband by feeding him to her big cats. It is our contention that she did so by, as gruesome as it may be, by putting his body in the meat grinder and the defendant just testified that she does in fact use this meat grinder to process food was her words to then feed to her cats as far as the relevance of the photo itself the jury should be able to see the photo of what she had at her very disposal given that it's quite a large grinder when when people hear meat grinder they most likely think of a kitchen item and therefore it is relevant May I have just a moment? Certainly. Do you, ha do you have any specific response to the 404B implications? Yes, Your Honor. The, we're not, it is our contention that she used this grinder to dispose of her husband's body. It's not, improper, it's a piece of circumstantial evidence that we are using to, to prove our case. I will overrule the objection. It is noted for the record. So it is admitted, Your Honor? Yes. May I publish it? You may. We can agree this is your meat grinder. Yes. 
It's a large grinder. Yes. Large enough to dispose of a human body. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, that question um, calls for speculation. There's no way that our, uh, Ms. Baja could know whether or not a human body could fit into a meat grinder. If I I'll, oh. I'll overrule the objection. Thank you. Ms. Baja, this meat grinder is large enough to dispose of a human body. I suppose so. You keep this grinder at Wild Wildlife. Yes. As far as you know, that's the same place that your husband was last seen alive. I suppose so. I want to talk about circumstances leading up to his disappearance. You two were having some marital problems. Yes. Your husband filed a temporary restraining order against you. He attempted to file, yes. Your Honor, permission to republish Exhibit 5, which has already, or I'm sorry, Exhibit 6, which has already been admitted. You may. Your husband wrote in a court document that he wanted a divorce. Yes. You, you do admit that one. Well, he wanted a divorce, yes. Right, he told you that. Yes. You, of course, deny that you ever threatened your husband. Correct. You certainly deny that you killed him. Correct. And I want to talk about what you claim you were doing that night. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you did not talk about what you were supposedly doing that night on direct examination. Uh, correct. So let's talk about it. You claim that you were taking care of newborn tiger cubs that night. Yes, unfortunately, the mother cub, uh, mother tiger had rejected the cubs. So I was not expecting that and had to rush out so I could get milk to feed them. Right. Let's back up a bit first, though. These weren't the first cubs you've ever had to nurse. Correct. And you, as you just told us, you want us to believe that on the night that your husband disappeared, you just so happened to run out of milk. Well, as I said, we were not expecting that particular mother tiger to reject her cubs. And I was not prepared for the need to have the milk ready for them. Right, but on the night that your husband disappeared, you had already been taking care of these cubs for a couple days. Um, as I said, the tiger rejected these cubs at that moment. And so I, they had been alive for a few days, but they were rejected by the tiger after some time. So to be clear, you were taking care of these cubs for a couple days because their mother re rejected them before the night that your husband disappeared. The cubs had been alive for a few days and I was maintaining, uh, watching them and making sure they were safe and that the mother was safe and then the mother rejected them. So I had to take full responsibility of taking care of them. So you had to go to the grocery store that night, you claim? Yes. At three o'clock in the morning? Yes. You also claim that on your way back from the supposed grocery store, your car just happened to break down. Unfortunately, yes. You also claim that a good Samaritan just happened to be driving by. Yes. That person then, according to you, drove to the side of the road and offered assistance. Well, in my rush to go out and get the milk for the cubs, I had forgotten my cell phone at home. So I particularly, specifically flagged them down to borrow their cell phone. And so the answer is yes, the Good Samaritan then proceeded to drive to the side of the road and help you. Yes. Now, when that person offered you their phone at three o'clock in the morning, you didn't call your husband. No. You called your brother. Yes. Who is a police officer. He's a sheriff, yes. Well, he's a deputy sheriff. Yes. 
not the sheriff. I said a sheriff, yes. Okay, I misheard you. He's a sh deputy sheriff in the same police department that investigated your husband's disappearance. Yes. Now, on direct examination, you testified that your husband would fly planes, correct? Yes. You said he was a private person. Yes. And according to your sworn testimony under oath, he would just fly off without informing you. Correct. And on all those other occasions when he would leave without telling you where he was or when he was going, you never called the police. Well, he would always come back. I'll ask my question again. On all the times where he flew off and you didn't know where he was or when he was coming back, you never called the police. Correct. You never reported him missing. Correct. He would always come back. But this time it was different, wasn't it? He didn't come back. Yes. Well, you reported him missing. Yes, because he didn't come back. You waited one day from the day you last saw him to report him missing. I don't remember the exact day that I reported him missing. It was August 18th, 2012. If you say yes. And that was at the very most a couple days after you had last seen him. Correct. Now, just two weeks after that, you came forward with a new will. I don't remember the exact time that uh, the will was shown to Cam, if that's what you're asking, but um, that will had been around for a couple months already. Well, let's talk about that will. You do agree that the will, or it's your contention that the will was signed just two days after Lou Donaldson signed the TRO. Yes. You agree that that will will purports to give you Lou Donaldson's estate. Yes. Gives you his business. Yes. And as far as you know, his business alone was worth $5 million. Yes. Well, I would like to specify we co-owned that business. Um, so of course I, I knew how much it was worth. Yes. 5 million. And before you met Lou Donaldson, respectfully, you, you didn't really have a lot of money. Correct. And sometime before you married Lou Donaldson, you knew he was a wealthy man. Once I got to know him, I, I learned that, yes. And you're aware that the business was started by the money that Lou Donaldson had saved up from selling cars. Yes, it was always his, his dream to start the business using that money. And just to be clear, as you sit here today, now that your husband's gone missing, you are a multimillionaire. I guess technically speaking, I am, but I, I don't live like that. I put all the money towards making sure that his legacy, Wild Wild Life, is a success and continues to be. Right. I, I understand what you claim you've done with it. But to be clear, you sit here today as a multimillionaire. Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay, any redirect? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Baja, I wanna to talk to you again about Exotic Bob. You mentioned him both in direct and cross. Could you tell us again how you know Mr. Exotic Bob? So, um, as it probably is no surprise, there aren't very many people who deal with large cats professionally as a business. So I know of him because we are in the same line of work, but I also know of him because his line of work is much different to ours. He illegally trades these animals and he does not treat them well. He's an atrocious person. So we actually, part of our work at the sanctuary was dealing with people like him who treated their animals badly and giving them a sanctuary to live at instead. 
You mentioned uh, earlier that he is in prison currently. How did he end up there? Well, um, as part of the horrible, atrocious work he does, I filed a civil case against him for that reason. Um, and that's why he's in jail. Have you, did you ever make any statements to him uh, regarding your relationship with Lou Donaldson? Absolutely not. And Ms. Baja, on cross, you were asked about a meat grinder. Um, how do you use meat grinders at Wild Wildlife or one meat grinder? Um, so, you know, big cats are carnivores and so they're big cats as well. So they eat a lot. And so we keep the meat grinder there to kind of speed along the process of being able to uh, make sure both the meat is consumable for them, but also to be able to do it in large quantities because of how much they eat. To your knowledge, was that meat grinder ever examined by the police? Um, I think so. And do you recall if they found anything there? I don't think they did. Objection, Your Honor. Improper opinion and speculation. Uh, Your Honor, the defendant would have personal knowledge if the police informed her whether or not they had examined the meat grinder. Um, so I'm only asking for her opinion, not, you know, as an expert or anything like that, but if she knew if they had found anything, if they had told her. If they hadn't told her, she could say no. I'm sorry, Your Honor. You're moving. Um, I, do, I do think that needs to be clarified. I think the way the testimony came out was, did they, not do you have any knowledge of. Um, so I'll strike the prior questions. You can re-ask them as to what she did and did not, does and does not know. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Baja, do you know if the police investigated the meat grinder? Uh, yes, they did. They came and investigated um, most of wild wildlife. And at any point, were you personally informed by them of what they had found, if anything? Um, not particularly that I recall, no. So you were not informed, uh, um, thank you. And they didn't, uh, were you ever told that any kind of DNA had been found? No, Objection. I mean, they let me. There is no evidence of this. Uh, may, I, may we approach? There's no evidence that the police did or did not test the meat grinder in the record other than the testimony, I, I believe, of the defense's expert who had said that he gleaned that the meat grinder was tested. We have no affirmative statement from the police one way or the other as to whether or not the no affirmative statement from the police themselves as to whether or not the meat grinder was tested. Um, again, Your Honor, I just asked, do you know, but I would be happy to move on from this line of questioning. You're muted, Your Honor. I do think it's time to move on from this line of questioning. Thank you. Now, Ms. Baja, what happened to the restraining order that uh, Lou Donaldson filed? It was not granted. And at that time, were you two still living together? Yes. And uh, you how long did you continue to live together? Uh, we never stopped living together. And did you continue to stay married? Yes. Now, when you met Lou Donaldson, did you know that he had money? No, I didn't. Did you have any reason to expect that he might have? No, I mean, um, he drove a beat up van, so I didn't know. And that I don't think I asked you, how did you meet him? Well, um, it's in a non-traditional story, if you will. Um, I was hitchhiking, I needed a ride and he pulled over and he gave me that ride. And, you know, I, I immediately got to know him. We, we clicked. Our personalities were one and the same. So we, we got along really well and found out we had a same passion of big cats. Uh, thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Is there any objection to releasing Ms. Bassa? No objection, Your Honor. No, Your okay, Honor. Ms. Bassa, you are excused. Does the defense have any further witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls Chris Renner to the stand. Mr. Renard is constructively sworn. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Renard. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? 
Good morning. My name is Chris Renard. Mr. Renard, are you employed? I am. What do you do for work? I'm an investigator and document examiner for Summit Life Insurance Company. Can you please explain to the jury what that entails and what you look at during your role? Sure. Um, so to put it bluntly, I investigate fraud. I am assigned to look into any given case and see if there's any legitimate reasons for us to not pay out an insurance policy to its beneficiary. How long have you been doing that for Summit Life? About 20 years now. Mr. Renner, does your job require any specialized education, training, or experience? It does. Can you please give the jury an overview of your educational background? Sure. I received a bachelor's in criminology from here uh, at Summit College. What, if any, additional training in your field have you completed? After receiving my degree from Summit, I went on to complete my training at the police academy here in Pioneer. And Mr. Renner, do you have any uh, prior experience, uh, prior to your time at Summit Life that's relevant uh, to your overall experience as an expert? I do. Prior to getting my job at Summit, I spent three years as a forensic document examiner for the Statesville Bureau of Investigation in their crime lab. What does that entail? It primarily entailed me looking into, again, forgeries and conducting investigations on documents such as will. Mr. Renner, do you hold any certifications? I do. I hold a couple of certifications. The first is from the Board of Forensic Document Examiners, which I renew every four years. And the second is from the Association of Certified Fraud Specialists. Have you served as an expert witness before? I have. I've been qualified to testify 25 times previously, specifically in the field of document examination. Um, and I've testified on behalf of both prosecutions as well as um, on behalf of Summit Life. Mr. Renard, how did you get involved in this case? Well, as per my job, Summit Life asked me to investigate whether the company was required to pay out Mr. Donaldson's uh, life insurance policy after Ms. Baja had him declared dead. Did you in fact conduct that investigation? I did. Were the methods that you used in that investigation reasonably relied upon by other experts in your field? Of course. Your Honor, at this time, we move to have Chris Renard admitted as an expert in handwriting analysis and forensic document examination. Any objection or voir dire? Your Honor, I have no objection um, in regards to him being an expert in handwriting analysis and document examinations um, and to that alone. Um, anything outside the scope of just that expertise, um, I may bring an objection at a later time. Certainly, I believe that those are the two categories that were offered by Ms. Drennan. Um, if you feel that we are straying outside of those expertise, of course, you may object. Um, Ms. Yes. Drennan, Mr. Renard will be entered as an expert in handwriting analysis, and I believe it was forensic document analysis as well? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Renard, I'd like to go back to how you became involved in this investigation. Did there come a time that you were asked to analyze a certain document in your investigation? Yes, I was asked by Summit to particularly look at Lou Donaldson's last will and testament. I believe my co-counsel is going to pull that document onto the screen for us to talk about. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. Mr. Renard, is this the document that you were asked to analyze? It was. Mr. Renner, can you give us an overview of what aspects of this document you, you took into account and analyzed? Sure. So with any will and testament, I'll commonly look at three things. The first of which is the language of the will itself. The second of which is uh, the signature on the will of the person making it. And I'll also look at the witnesses present on the will. Mr. Renner, you mentioned the signature. Uh, let's, let's talk about that. Um, can you give the jury an overview of how someone like yourself goes about the process of analyzing whether or not a signature is genuine? Sure. The common method of practice in my field is to do three things. So first, you want to collect samples of the signature from the will. So I 
collected samples of Lou Donaldson's signature um, in other aspects of his life. I looked at a note that he'd written to his daughter. I looked at some court documents with his signature on him, as well as this last will and testament. Then from those signatures, you wanna analyze any common features between them. No two signatures are exactly the same, and it's a red flag if they are, but everyone carries certain commonalities from signature to signature. Then after I understand what those features are, I'll compare them to the signature in question to make sure that they're present. Mr. Renner, did you come to a conclusion regarding the authenticity of the signature on this will? I did. Could you let us know what that is? Sure. So while there were some differences um, between the signature on this last will and testament and the other signatures that I reviewed in my preparations for this trial, I found those differences to be inconclusive. Can you elaborate a bit more for the jury on what you mean by inconclusive? Sure. So those common features I found were still present in the signature on this last will and testament. For example, if you look at the L on this document, the top loop is smaller than the bottom loop as is present on other signatures I reviewed, as well as you'll see the O on um, Lou will have a double loop through it. Uh, that was another commonality I found. And then I look to the U in Lou and the N in Donaldson and notice that those had a small tail embellishment, which we call in my field, which just means that the end of those letters kind of has an uptick to it. Um, so in total, I found sufficient evidence that no one could conclude this document is a forgery. Mr. Renner, you touched upon this a bit when you were describing your overall process to analyzing signatures, but I'll ask it specifically to get clarification for the jury. Does a person's signature always look the same? No, it doesn't. It's um, impacted by a variety of factors. Can you let us know what some of those factors may be? Sure. So, you know, someone's signature, as I said earlier, is never the exact same from one time to another. You know, sometimes you're in a hurry. So therefore, your signature might be more scrambled than it normally is. Uh, someone's signature is also impacted by cir circumstances such as what they're writing with, you know, pen, pencil, type of pen, etc. Um, in my field, I've also found that age and the health of the person signing can also play a role. Mr. Renner, let's move on from the signature to the document as a whole. You mentioned that you took various aspects of the entire document into consideration. Did you reach an ultimate conclusion regarding the authenticity of the document as a whole? Yes, I found the document to be authentic. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. Mr. Renner, uh, let's talk about why you were involved in this case to begin with. It's because Summit Life asked you to investigate. Did you end up providing a uh, recommendation to Summit Life Insurance? Yes, I recommended that we pay out the life insurance policy. Mr. Renan, I'll ask you a hypothetical. If you were to have any hesitation as to the authenticity of either the signature on the will or of the document as a whole, would you have made that recommendation to Summit Life Insurance? Absolutely not. Uh, I stood nothing to gain from Summit paying out the life insurance policy. And from my company, there's $5 million at stake. So I certainly, if there was any indication to me that we shouldn't pay out the will, I would have reserved or advised that we withhold payments until those uncertainties are resolved. No further questions, Your Honor. Any cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Renner, um, on direct, you talked about comparing signatures, right? Yes. You talked about how you looked at Lou Donaldson's signature on the will. That's right. 
And you compared that signature to other known signatures. Correct. Your Honor, um, in the exhibit binder, there are um, there's an addendum to Mr. Renner's report, which is um, the signature comparison that he compiled. I'm marking that as exhibit nine for evidence and uh, opposing counsel already has a copy of that. Can Mr. Renner pull out his copy? Of course. Mr. Renner, can you pull out your copy for me. I have it in front of me, thank you. Sure, Mr. Renner, um, that is your signature comparison, right? Yes, it is. My signature is at the bottom, but blues are in the document. Sure, and uh, it fairly and accurately uh, shows that that uh, addendum to your notes. It does. Your Honor, I move Exhibit uh, Nine into evidence. Can Can you provide me with the Bates number for this exhibit so I can take a look before admitting it? And does defense have any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Let me get that Bates number for you real quick, Your Honor. And, and given there's no objection, I will, you don't need to get, provide the, me with, with the base number. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Dorash, when you get a second, can you screen share um, the signature comparison? Thank you. Now, Mr. Renner, this is your signature comparison sheet, right? Yes. At the bottom of that signature comparison sheet, you have your notes. I do. And in those notes, you say that there were differences, right? Correct. You said that you could not say that the signature was genuine. Not 100%. Again, um, you can only have a reasonable degree of scientific certainty in my field, but that's not the same as 100% certainty. Sure. Um, you also said in your own words that it's possible that someone tried to copy the signature. I did. At best, on direct, you even said that your results were inconclusive. That's correct. Now, on direct, you said inconclusive means that no one could determine whether that signature was genuine. Is that uh, what you meant, or did you misspeak? Well, not with a reasonable scientific degree of certainty in my field, no. But you didn't write in your notes that no one could say that it, was, uh, that it could not be genuine. Not explicitly, no. Now, you also talked about the witnesses to the will on direct. Thank you, Mr. Dorash, for screen sharing that. Um, you also talked about the witnesses. Now, you had an opportunity to talk to these witnesses, right? Yes, I spoke to both Samantha Lane and uh, Ms. Baja. That's right. So one of the, the witnesses was the defendant, Ms. Baja, as you just said. Yes. Right. And the other one was a woman named Samantha Lane. Correct. And in those conversations, they both told you that they saw Lou Donaldson sign the will. Yes, initially in Ms. Lane's case. Sure, and you say initially in Ms. Lane's case because then you received a letter, right? Objection, Your Honor. I the basis of the objection? Objection, Your Honor. I, um, this letter is inadmissible hearsay, so I, I find that this is where plaintiff's counsel is directing his line of questioning, I thought it appropriate to discuss the letter now. I think we're a moment early. You can continue laying foundation, Mr. Jones, and then Ms. Drennan, you're welcome to re-raise your objection. Thank you. So Mr. Renner, you did receive a letter, right? I received a letter uh, that had Samantha Lane's name on it. I followed up to see if it could be her, but I was unable to. That's right. You received a letter. It had Samantha Lane's name on it. And at the top, it was addressed to you. Yes. Um, Your Honor, in the exhibit binder, there's Samantha Lane's letter. Um, opposing counsel already has a copy. May I ask Mr. Renner to bring out his copy? Yes. Mr. Renner, do you have your copy in front of you? I do. All right, and that's the letter that you received, right? Yeah, it says, Dear Mr. Renner, at the top, and uh, the name Samantha Lane is written at the bottom. Your Honor, I offer this letter um, as Exhibit 10. Any objection from defense? Yes, Your Honor, I'm renewing my objection on uh, two bases. One, hearsay. This letter is an inadmissible hearsay. Secondly, 
the uh, the witness is unable to properly authenticate this document and therefore this document cannot come into evidence. If I may proffer, the witness himself in his own um, report for this case says that he does not think that the letter came from Samantha Lane, cannot verify that it came from Samantha Lane. And in, in his report, he referred to the letter as a hoax. On that basis, this letter cannot properly be authenticated by this witness. Your Honor, may I uh, respond? Yes, please respond to the hearsay um, followed by the authentication. Yes, Your Honor. Um, this is actually, it is hearsay, but it is an exception being that Mr. Rennert is an expert in this field. He's already been admitted as an expert in handwriting analysis, document examinations, um, and he's talked about all of the things that he's relied upon in his investigation. Um, this is, he's already stated that he received this letter, um, and so the jury should be able to hear that he received this letter and disregarded it uh, according to Rule 703. Now, Your Honor, as far as the second uh, part of that, uh, uh, Mr. Renner um, will say that he did not do it, but the, he needs to be able to say that on the stand. Um, his record um, that he wrote was not admitted into evidence at this time, um, and it's probative for the jury to be able to hear what he did and did not do, what he did and did not receive in order to evaluate his credibility. Any response to the 703? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the defense asserts that 703, while it may be true that uh, Mr. Renner can take various pieces of inadmissible evidence into account with regards to rendering an overall opinion in this case, 703 is not a hearsay exception, and that that does not bar, or it does bar, it's, it's still inadmissible hearsay. Um, and then additionally, with regards to plaintiff's counsel's second argument about the introduction of the letter, and now that's a basis for Mr. Renner uh, should be saying this on the stand. That's not a justification for, for allowing this to come into evidence just because he began the line of questioning on this matter. I will find under, first I'll begin with authentication. I'll find that the letter can be authenticated as a document that he received. It is noted that it cannot be authenticated as coming from Ms. Lane, and certainly that's right for cross-examination. However, I do think there's enough under 901 that this witness can authenticate the letter as something he received and considered when coming to his opinion. As for a hearsay exception, I find that the document is hearsay. However, it is something that the expert did rely on or did review in coming to a decision. Um, so I will admit it for that purpose. Um, certainly, Ms. Drennan, your concerns are noted and certainly ripe for a, a redirect. Thank you, Honor. Now, Mr. Renner, uh, sorry, I offer um, Exhibit 10 into evidence, Your Honor. Just wanted to clarify that that uh, signature is admitted. I, okay, sorry, you're muted. I see you had not, I will take that as a yes. Mr. Dorash, can you please uh, screen share for me? Thank you. Now, Mr. Renner, this is the letter that you received? Yeah. And at the top, it says, Mr. Renner, dear Mr. Renner. It does. At the bottom, it says Samantha Lane. Correct. It reads, I wasn't being honest when we last spoke. Where are you pulling that from? Uh, it says right after, I felt it was important for you to know that I wasn't being honest when we last spoke. Yes, I see where you're reading from now. That's what it says. I was coerced into signing that will. Yes, it says that. I never saw Mr. Donaldson sign. Correct. Now, after receiving this letter, you attempted to contact uh, Ms. Lane, right? Yeah, I felt it was really odd because I had talked to her previously and she had candidly said that she saw Mr. Donaldson sign it. I don't ever recall seeing any hesitation in her voice. So of course, you know, receiving something as this, being one of two witnesses on a signature, I felt it was my duty to follow up. 
However, after a few attempts of trying, we just weren't ever able to reach her. That's right. You weren't ever to reach her. Um, in your own words, it was as if she vanished. Yes, it was. And because you weren't able to reach her, you disregarded this letter, right? Well, then I took other factors into account. From what I was able to learn about the investigation, as well as talking to Miss Baja about Lou Donaldson signing the will, I concluded um, that that was sufficient enough for me to uh, outweigh, I guess, the note that I received, because I have no idea what Samantha Lane's um, handwriting looks like beyond her signature and had no way to authenticate uh, this letter. I appreciate what you said, Mr. Renner, but all I asked was that you disregarded the letter, right? Disregard, again, is a strong word. That assumes to me in my field that, you know, I put it aside without considering it further. Again, in my field, you have to consider things in context from um, the totality of everything else I reviewed. Now, Mr. Renner, you wrote a, you wrote a note where you talked about this letter, right? A note? I mean, I filed a report in this sure. case, yes. And in that report, you got to write it and you reviewed it to make sure it was accurate? Sure. And uh, to the best of your knowledge, it was accurate? Yeah, it was. All right. I would like to point you to that note. Um, let me pull it up because I actually believe you did say the words that it was disregarded. Um, if Mr. Dorash could find that and pull it up on screen so that uh, Mr. Renner is capable of seeing the, the language. If you're not able to find it, Mr. Dorash, I have it in front of me. I can hold it up to the camera. I know with Zoom, it's a little difficult. Mr. Jones, I also have it pulled up in front of me. Okay, are you able to see um, on that second page about one, two, three, four, five paragraphs down, uh, I believe it's the second to last statement. You say, given that I could not confirm the authenticity of the letter, I have chosen to disregard the letter as a hoax. Your words, correct? Yeah, you had privately admitted the first part of that sentence as well as the preceding sentence before that. Again, it's common for document examiners such as myself to corroborate witnesses' signatures, and in light of the other things I was able to corroborate in this case, I did disregard the signature. Your Honor, I ask that you ask Mr. Renner to answer the simple question, did he or did he not disregard this letter as a hoax? I think he has answered that. And the answer was what? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I missed it. Your Honor, Your Honor, I think he has with explanation. I think he said that he did say that, but then is providing the jury with further context, which I will allow. Yes, Your Honor. The last thing I want to talk to you about, Mr. Renner, is the content of the will. You, you were able to read the will, right? I was. You saw that the will gave everything to Karen Baja. It did. Now, in that will, you saw something that you had never seen before, right? Yeah, there was language um, that said, you know, should Mr. Donaldson die or disappear, he would leave everything in effect to Ms. Baja. That's right. And you've been working in this field for 20 years, right? Yeah, it dates myself a little bit, but uh, yeah, about 20 years now. And you've seen hundreds of wills in that time. I have. And you've never seen the words, if I should die or disappear. Not exactly, no. In your own words, you said that those words were suspicious. Yeah, they were a red flag to me and certainly a kicking off point to my work and investigation into this claim. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Renard, let's stop. I'm sorry. Ms. Drennan, um, you cut out and I couldn't. That's 
Okay, so we've got um, plaintiff's counsel's microphone still on. Uh, Mr. Renner, let's start off with where plaintiff's counsel left off uh, regarding the language of the will. Did you take the language of the will into consideration in your overall analysis? Of course. And now let's talk about Samantha Lane. Uh, can you remind the jury of the conversation that you had with Samantha Lane? Yeah, so again, the first time I talked to Samantha to corroborate that she did in fact sign the document and witness Mr. Donaldson sign the last will and testament, she expressed no hesitation to me that she did. Um, so, you know, I took that as it may before I received the letter. And after I received the letter, I was very confused. Um, so obviously I did everything in my power to reach out to her again and to confirm that she did in fact write this letter. And after countless attempts to reach out to her, I just wasn't able to reach her again. How many times have you seen Samantha Lane's signature? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again, please? Yes, how many times have you seen Samantha Lane's purported signature? Uh, just uh, once on the last will and testament, and then I, I saw her name on that letter. Again, I, I'm not sure if that was her or not. Can you remind the jury of your expert opinion on the authenticity of that letter? That I found it to be a hoax. Mr. Renan, I'll ask you again if you had any hesitation as to the authenticity of the signature on the will or of the document as a whole, would you have made the same recommendation to Summit Life Insurance? Well, of course not. It would have gone against my ethical duties of my employer and I, we had a lot to lose on the insurance claim. So if there were any hesitation on my part, I would have suggested that we wait until the investigation um, in regard to Lou Donaldson's disappearance was finished. No further questions. Any objection to releasing um, expert Renard? No objections, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Renard, thank you for your time. With that, does the defense have any additional witnesses? No additional witnesses, Your Honor. The defense rests its case. At this time, it appears we are in the posture for closing arguments. Does either side need a recess prior to those arguments? Your Honor, if I may, prior to that, um, prior to answering that question, may the defense uh, renew its motion for a directed verdict? Yes. Do, do, yes, you may. Your Honor, looking at the, all of the evidence in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, no reasonable juror could find that the defendant, Karen Baja, is liable for the wrongful death of Lou Donaldson. First, the plaintiff has not established that Lou Donaldson is dead. Specifically, Karen Donaldson testified on the stand here today and said that she was here to, or she hired Taylor Pride to figure out what happened to her father. In her own words, she has not asserted that her father is even dead. And secondly, Plaintiff has not uh, established that it's more likely than not that Karen Baja is responsible for the death of Lou Donaldson. They have presented nothing more than a video that is that without explanation as to relevance or why this person should be taken as credible. Uh, additionally, evidence that the plaintiff owns a piece of equipment that is necessary to run her business is not evidence of anything more than that. Response, Ms. Stern? Your Honor, I stand on my previous argument as far as my response to this motion. Okay, the um, motion is noted, it will be denied. And with that, is there anything further before we proceed to closing arguments? Nothing from the defense, Your Honor. Your Honor, we would ask um, just for a brief recess if possible, just a couple minutes. Certainly, how much time are you looking for? Uh, some three to three to five minutes. Certainly, let's. It is on. I think it is um, on Mountain Time, ten thirty nine. Currently, we will return at ten forty five. Um, prepared, so use that time if you need to set anything up with the technology. Please be prepared to begin at ten forty five. And um, the only thing we'll do before that is a time check from our timekeepers. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks. We'll reconvene in five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor.
Okay, I have 1045 on my clock. Do we have both of our scoring jurors back in the room? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Calhoun, are you present in the room? We'll wait a few moments while we do that. Timekeepers, do we have a time check? Yes, Your Honor. Um, we're doing pretty good on time over here. Uh, I have the defense with about 28 minutes remaining. Okay, and time for the plaintiff. Yes, that's consistent with what I have and um, same as before, no worries. Okay. Um, how about uh, Ms. Calhoun, do we have you present in the room? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. So we are prepared to proceed with closing arguments. Uh, we will begin with the plaintiff. Closing argument for the plaintiff. Yes, Your Honor. And may I reserve any remaining time for rebuttal? You may. If anything should happen to me, tell the police to look at Karen because she will be the one responsible for my death. And she was. What Cam Donaldson did not know, what she could not know, is that just two weeks after her father spoke those chilling words, he would be gone forever. At the beginning of today's trial, my co-counsel told you that the reason that Cam Donaldson no longer has a father is because the defendant refused to take no for an answer. And so she took matters into her own hands. Let's start with that first point. The defendant wouldn't take no for an answer when it came to her fairy tale marriage. It began when the defendant, who grew up poor, married Lou Donaldson, a multimillionaire who even had the added bonus of being a fellow cat lover. The defendant knew that with Lou Donaldson, she'd have hundreds of big cats and millions of dollars. She knew that without him, she'd have nothing. That's why when he told her he wanted a divorce, she refused to take no for an answer by threatening her own husband. Unfortunately, Lou Donaldson is no longer here with us today but his words still speak loud and clear. The words that he put in the request to the court, where he said that he was afraid for his life because the defendant threatened to kill him. Of course, the defendant denies that she ever threatened her husband. She wants us to believe that Lou Donaldson lied when he sought protection from the court. He just made it all up for fun. But what the defendant can't hide from is how this request made her feel. How angry, how furious at the thought of having to get a divorce. And that's why she took matters into her own hands by silencing Lou Donaldson forever. That brings me to my second point. The defendant took matters into her own hands. Unfortunately, we weren't able to hear from Exotic Bob live on the stand today. But he told us how the defendant took matters into her own hands. And look, I'll be the first to admit, Exotic Bob, the man can sing, but he's a bit exotic. But we don't choose the victims in any given case. The defendant does. Exotic Bob told us the defendant threatened to feed him to her kitties, just like she did her husband. A confession that may sound like it's from a crazy Netflix series, but what, when we dug a little deeper and what you have learned today is that it is exactly what she did. 
she fed him to the lions and tigers that he worked his life to protect. Something so disgusting, it's hard for me to even talk about without getting a pit in my stomach. The defendant told you about her so-called kitties, like the lions with large, sharp teeth. They eat a lot of meat, members of the jury. Meat that she feeds them after she's grinded it up in her massive meat grinder. The meat grinder, by her own admission, that's possible of disposing of a human body. That's crazy, the defendant says. I have an alibi. Members of the jury, you saw the defendant. You heard my cross-examination. She wants us to believe that it's a coincidence that on the night her husband went missing, she just happened to run out of milk at three o'clock in the morning. A big old coincidence that on the way back from the supposed grocery store, her car just happened to break down. A coincidence that some hero was driving by who then pulled over to the side of the road to the side of the road and offered her their cell phone. The defendant calls all of these things coincidences, but the law calls it something different. The law calls it circumstantial evidence. Her Honor will instruct you that we can prove this case to you through circumstantial evidence, which is really just a fancy way of saying that you are allowed to connect the dots. And there are a whole lot of dots here, members of the jury. Of course, the defense wants you to believe that because we didn't bring you the body or DNA or video surveillance, that means we didn't prove our case today. But this is a civil case, not a criminal one. All we had to prove was that it's more likely than not that Lou Donaldson is dead, that he's dead because of this defendant's intentional or reckless conduct, that Cam Donaldson suffered injuries because of her father's death, and that therefore the defendant is the one responsible for those injuries. Through circumstantial evidence, we've done that. The circumstances don't end with exotic Bob or with the lions and the meat grinder or even with the defendant's pathetic alibi. Because the defendant continued to take matters into her own hands even after she got rid of her husband. She still had to figure out how to keep those hundreds of big cats and millions of dollars. How to make sure that no one would know what Lou Donaldson's actual intentions were that were in that original will. But Cam Donaldson knew. Just one day after the defendant reported her husband missing, she broke into wild wildlife and stole the lockbox that contained Lou Donaldson's prior will. Of course, the defendant, again, denies that she did that. In fact, she told us that she has never seen the gate at Wild Wildlife. But what she can't deny is that some weeks later, the defendant can't quite recall, she showed up with this. A new will that gives, that leaves Lou Donaldson's daughter with absolutely nothing. And instead leaves the defendant with everything hundreds of big cats and millions of dollars all for her. Of course, the defense will get up here and tell you this will is genuine. But the testimony of the two experts tells us otherwise. And I'm not even going to waste time talking about what Taylor Pride had to say because you heard her expert opinion that this will is fraudulent. But what occurred to me during the testimony of the defense's expert is that we may as well have called Chris Rennert ourselves because he was forced to admit that he can't say one way or another whether the signature on this will was forged. It's possible that someone could have forged this will. 
He also admitted that he's never once seen the word disappear on a will before. Want to know why he's never seen it? Because he's never had a woman make her husband disappear and make sure that language got in the will. But what the defendant didn't think about when she made this fake document was what date to put on here. Members of the jury, when you look at the timing of this will, time tells all. Time testified that on June 4th, um, excuse me, June 12th, 2012, the defend Lou Donaldson filed that temporary restraining order against the defendant. And the new will that was dated just two days later on June 14th. Do you really think that just two days after Lou Donaldson sought protection from the court, saying how scared he was of the defendant, just two days later, he turned around and decided to give everything to her? Do you really believe that Lou Donaldson, who had a close relationship with his only daughter, decided in that two-day period that he would completely cut her out of his will? Of course not. The defendant faked this document and thought that she could get away with it. And she almost did, didn't she? But fortunately, there's another date on the timeline of this case. And that's today. Because today is the day that you get to help Cam Donaldson. It's the day that you get to tell the defendant she can't take matters into her own hands by killing someone just because she didn't get her way. So I ask you to consider, where does this all leave Cam Donaldson? Cam will live the rest of her life without a father. Her dad will never walk her down the aisle at her wedding will never be a grandfather to her children. The pain and suffering that Cam endures will be with her the rest of her life. Not to mention the thoughts that come into her mind whenever she thinks about how her father died. Members of the jury, I wish that I could ask you to bring Lou Donaldson back to life. Because if you could, that's all Cam would want. She'd want her dad back. But we know you can't do that. What we can do, because this defendant killed her own husband to keep his money, what we can do is speak in a language that she understands. A language that motivates her. Money. And in order to talk about money, we have to talk about what Cam lost. What Cam lost was everything. She lost her father, her business partner, her best friend. She lost any chance at receiving an inheritance. She lost her chance at carrying on her dad's dream. Which is why at the end of today's trial, you will be asked to choose between two verdict forms. One of those forms has a dollar sign on it and the other does not. You can vindicate Cam Donaldson by choosing verdict form A and putting a number on that line. I can't tell you exactly what that number should be. I can't tell you how much a father's life is worth. But what I can tell you is that the defendant now has $10 million dollars even though she's the one responsible for Lou Donaldson's death, even though she's the reason that Cam Donaldson will live the rest of her life without a father. I'm not going to even insult you and suggest a number above that 10 million because that's your decision and yours alone. But for good reason, there is no maximum amount that you can award this plaintiff. Today is the day 
that you take matters into your hands by vindicating Cam Donaldson and finding this defendant liable. Thank you. Closing argument for the defense. Thank you, Anna. Members of the jury, in 2012, Karen Baja and Lou Donaldson were having marital problems. No one has denied that here today. After a particularly bad fight in June, Lou Donaldson decided that he wanted Karen out of his life. He was done with the marriage. He filed a restraining order against her. When that was denied on June 12th, it looked like he had no option left if he wanted out now. Divorce would have taken too long. He was ready to leave. But there was one thing holding Lou Donaldson back. He couldn't just leave at the drop of a hat like he wanted. What was that? His beloved cats. The lions and tigers and leopards at Wild Wild Life, they depended on him and he loved them. And so he knew if he were to leave, he would need to ensure that they were looked after. And there's only one person who is both as passionate about those animals as Lou and is capable of taking care of them as he was. That is Karen Baja. So once Lou Donaldson decided that he didn't want Karen in his life anymore, he was out, he was ready to leave, and the only option he had was to get into one of his planes and fly away, he wrote a will. But see, he knew he was coming back, was not coming back. He was planning ahead when he wrote this will. So he carefully selected the language in it. He chose the phrase, should I die or disappear? And he also selected to write, I leave to Karen Baja all of my real and personal property whatsoever. That way, Lou knew that no matter what, this will would ensure that the cats in Wild Wild Life were in the care and custody of Karen Baja. Today, the plaintiff is filing a wrongful death suit against Karen Baja because she is upset that her father's plan did not include her. Members of the jury, to prove wrongful death, the plaintiff has the burden of proving to you that it's more likely than not that Karen Baja's intentional or reckless conduct caused Lou Donaldson's death. They have not done that today. In the opening, they provided a gruesome story to you. They haven't proven that story. Not only has the plaintiff been unable to point to any specific conduct from Karen Baja, whether it be intentional or reckless, but this entire case and assertion is based on a story that the plaintiff has made up. The plaintiff hasn't met her burden of proof. Disappearance is not death. Accusations are not evidence. They're not even circumstantial evidence. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. Let's talk about how the plaintiff started off its case in chief today. They showed you a video. They didn't tell you why this video is relevant. They didn't tell you who it was at first or why you should even find them credible. And what was the video of? A man in a jail cell. His legal name is Exotic Bob. He chose that. He's strumming a tune and spitting out accusations. The plaintiff has explained nothing more than what you saw in the video. But let's talk about that. Who is Exotic Bob? You heard from Karen Baja why he was in jail. She put him there. Why would he have anything good? Why would he have anything good to say about her? Of course he wouldn't. He's sitting in a jail cell because of a suit that Karen Baja filed against him because he treats animals in a way that she finds grotesque. Of course he's angry. 
at, at Karen Baja. The, the plaintiff wants to call this a confession of sorts. What it is is nothing more than giving airtime to someone who might be an aspiring musician. It doesn't really tell us more than that, does it? But it does tell us something, that that's the first thing that the plaintiff chose to show you. It just shows that they have nothing more than stories. But let's continue to talk about stories. You heard Cam Donaldson testify on the stand here today. She told you about an incident that happened at Wild Wild Life after her father disappeared. In this story, she's asserting that Karen Bosch is both cunning and cruel enough and smart enough to pull off a plan that involves killing her husband, leaving absolutely no evidence behind, fooling an entire police force, but then also is foolish enough to break into her own office of a business that she owned, a place to which she had keys, set off an alarm system she knew about, and get caught red-handed with some lockbox? Those don't add up. But let's see why. Members of the jury, Cam Donaldson testified today that the front lock at Wild Wild Life was cut that morning. Karen Baja has keys to this lock. Why would she need to cut it? Well, she didn't cut it according to the plaintiff. The, uh, there was another person there, but the plaintiff has brought in no other evidence of that aside from their story. And then the plaintiff also asserted that the gate to the back of Wild Wild Life was also destroyed. So did Karen Baja cut the lock and then run around to the other side of the business, break the gate and crawl in? Again, she would have a key to that. It's already not adding up. Now the plaintiff testified that her desk was in the office. Inside this desk, apparently, is a lockbox that apparently contains the only copy of her father's last will and testament. Now, the plaintiff had no issue testifying as to the damage that was done on this lock and this gate. But when my co-counsel asked about damage to the desk, she couldn't remember about that. She couldn't remember if her desk was damaged. She's asserting that the plaintiff not only broke into both, but must have broken into this one as well. It's already not making any sense. And because of that, you cannot accept Cam Donaldson's testimony as it relates to seeing Karen Baja on the premises of Wild Wild Life at six o'clock in the morning that day. If we cannot accept that part of Cam Donaldson's testimony, think about what else we can't accept that Cam Donaldson said today. We certainly can't expect that all these incriminating statements that come out and there's no other evidence of that aside from Cam Donaldson. Members of the jury, not only has the plaintiff been unable to assert that Karen Baja's intentional or reckless conduct caused Lou Donaldson's death, but the plaintiff has also not been able to prove to you that it's more likely than not that Karen Baja's intentional or reckless conduct caused injury to her. The plaintiff bases her entire case on this will. This is Lou Donaldson's last will and testament. We've seen it throughout the course of this trial. You'll know the plaintiff is not in it. And we know why. Because Lou Donaldson was planning ahead when he wrote this. He knew if he were to leave, if anything were to happen to him, the cats had to be in Karen's care. You heard Karen Baja testify today as to what type of care that is. It's 24 hour around the clock care. And it's so niche and specialized that you can't possibly expect to hire someone off the street and throw them in a tiger cage. Ms. Baja also testified that Cam Donaldson ran administrative work at Wild Wildlife. She didn't take care of the cats. She also didn't even bother to tell us what she did as her father's assistant. 
yet she wants you to award the business to her? Lou Donaldson knew of the disparity between Karen Baja and Cam Donaldson as it pertained to the cats. He knew that if Cam Donaldson was the owner of Wild Wild Life, those cats wouldn't be cared for. He had to ensure that they were in Karen Baja's care and custody. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. You heard from Chris Renner today. He's an expert at Summit Life Insurance and has 20 years of experience examining documents like the will you just saw. He's the only unbiased witness you have heard testify today. Now, I asked him twice while he was on the stand if he were to have any hesitation as to the authenticity of either the signature on the will or the document as a whole, he would not have made that recommendation to Summit Life. And after carefully analyzing both the signature, the document, and the circumstances surrounding the will, including the evidence that pl the plaintiff's counsel has tried to admit as true, a purported hoax letter, Mr. Renner took all of this into account and he recommended that the will was genuine and that the life insurance policy should be paid to Karen Baja. Now, he's not the only expert you heard from today. You also heard from Cam Donaldson's private investigator, Taylor Pry. Now, Ms. Pry testified to the signature of the will. And as plaintiff's counsel said in closing, she wouldn't even bother to get into the testimony of that. There's a reason for that. It's because Taylor Pride is not a credible handwriting analysis expert. I asked Ms. Pride, is she certified by the leading organization in handwriting analysis? She's not. I asked her, have you ever taught a course in handwriting analysis? She hasn't. I asked her, are you published in the field of handwriting analysis? She's not. She's taken a two week course though, back in 2002. So that apparently allows her to say that this is a forgery. Now let's take her testimony as a whole here. Keep in mind what the plaintiff is choosing to glaze over, the timeline as it pertains to Taylor Pride. Taylor Pride was hired by Cam Donaldson in 2017, not in 2012 after her father went missing. Now, Cam Donaldson on the stand today said she doesn't know what happened to her father. She could have hired a private investigator like Taylor Pride back then, or at any point in five years between 2012 and 2017, but she didn't. She didn't hire Taylor Pride until the will came into play, until she realized she was not in the will. It's not until she realized her father's plan didn't include her, and to get what she wanted, she would have to paint the will as a forgery that she went out and hired someone like Taylor Pride. Keep that in mind when you are considering Taylor Pride's testimony here today. Now, between the video, a false story that cannot physically be true, as I just showed you, and false statements that are not supported by other evidence, an expert that was hired in order to paint this will as a forgery. Between all of that, it's clear that the plaintiff is grasping at straws and is falsely accusing Karen Baja of murder because she is upset that her father's plan did not include her. Members of the jury, disappearance is not death. Accusations are not evidence. They're not even circumstantial evidence. Now, to render a verdict for the plaintiff in this case would mean that you need to believe that all of the elements of wrongful death have been proven to you by the plaintiff here today. They have not. First, the plaintiff has not proven that it's more likely than not that Lou Donaldson is dead. Think about what the plaintiff has shown you as to that effect. Aside from perhaps relying on the fact that Ms. Baja had him declared dead in probate court, 
that's not sufficient for them to meet their burden here. They've talked about a gruesome story of a meat grinder. However, they have not shown any, any evidence that that meat grinder was used for their grotesque accusation. It's an industrial piece of equipment that Ms. Baja has to have on site to keep her business running. And if the plaintiff is really asserting that Lou Donaldson is dead, why would Cam Donaldson on the stand here today say something to the effect of, I don't know what happened to my father. Second, the plaintiff has not proven that it's more likely than not that Karen Baja's intentional or reckless conduct caused Lou Dawson's death. Now, we talked about exotic Bob, but I'll bring him up again. They are calling that a confession. Now, members of the jury, I'll let you assert for yourself whether or not you think someone who is sitting in a prison cell because the plaintiff put him there and who mistreats animals and among other things that you could have seen for yourself through the video, you can determine whether or not someone like that is credible. And regardless of that assessment, keep in mind, that's the only piece of evidence that the plaintiff has offered to this effect. Again, an accusation is not evidence. And lastly, the plaintiff has not proven that it's more likely than not that Karen Baja's intentional or reckless conduct caused injury to Cam Donaldson. How could they prove this without proving all of those three before? There's simply no evidence of that. Lou Donaldson wrote his last will and testament the way that he did because it was what he wanted. He needed to ensure that those cats were in the custody and care of Karen Baja. Members of the jury, if you find that even one or more of these elements has not been proven to you by preponderance of the evidence, you must render a verdict for the defendant. Render a verdict that the defendant is not liable. Thank you. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Since the defense calls our case a story, I'd like to talk about their story. They want us to believe that Lou Donaldson planned all of this out and meticulously decided to leave everything he owned to the defendant. But it gets better. He supposedly did that just two days after he filed a temporary restraining order against her. According to their story, Lou did that because no one else in the world would have been able to take care of his cats like she could. Even if that were true, members of the jury, it still doesn't explain why he would cut his only child out of his will as if she never existed as if they didn't work together for 20 years. And I'll admit it, the defendant, she did a pretty good job at covering her tracks. But the defense's story doesn't change those little clues that the defendant left throughout. Clues like leaving her husband's glasses and car keys inside the van that she planted. Clues like the timing of the TRO. Clues like reporting her husband missing before anyone even knew that he had died or, in her words that she put in the will, disappeared. These clues are not a fictional story, members of the jury. They're circumstances that give you reason to vindicate Cam Donaldson, find the defendant liable. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I, that brings us to the end of the round, I believe. Thank you all for participating. You guys did a wonderful job. Um, we have two scoring jurors with us as well, Ms. Chandler and Ms. Calhoun. 
um, if they want to address you guys or give you guys any feedback, I'm happy to give them the opportunity to do that um, now. But really, you guys were wonderful. The, what you're able to do with technology is far beyond what I see in actual courtrooms and what I can actually do in courtrooms smoothly. So thank you guys. You guys were wonderful. Ms. Calhoun or Ms. Chandler, do you have any, any comments for the group? Your Honor, I believe we go to the judging sheets now and we type it out yes. for them and score it that way. Yes, certainly. Um, thank you guys for your time. With that, I know you guys have much more to do. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Your so Honor. Much. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Great job, guys. Great job, everybody. Y'all did great. Thank you.